Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final tutorial of Transform 2020. Uh, glad to have you all here. This is pretty exciting. I've been behind the scenes for uh, quite a few of them all week long, uh, and it's uh, it's interesting to uh, experience it from this seat now. So um, fortunate also to do this presentation with, with Matt. So uh, right off the bat, some of you are probably still wondering if, if we're related, and uh, indeed we are not, as you can probably tell from, from our different accents. But uh, yeah, as far as we know, as far as we know, maybe back, you know, some distance. But uh, yeah, briefly about me, my name's Brendan. Uh, I'm Canadian. I'm living in Houston. Uh, I work at uh, a company called Enthought, which is a scientific computing company. Uh, I'd say at this point, I've kind of become a digital geoscientist. Um, you know, you can look up my LinkedIn profile if you're interested in all of that. But I'm uh, a proud Swung member and have really enjoyed this community and, uh, uh, and getting to know all the folks um, over the events that I've done, the hackathons and so on. And uh, uh, happy to be here to talk to you about this today. So Matt and I were brainstorming something fun to do for the last session of uh of transform this year and you know we'd both been talking about web apps lately uh, and i know that javascript's have been a big conversational topic this week and some folks are working on dash for some hackathon projects uh justin's well log visualization visualization in um uh, javascript and so on and so uh we've both been playing around with it and also talking about how you know, ideas go from the prototype stage and Jupyter notebooks and so on to actually turn it into a tool uh, that other people can use uh, and, and what bit of that journey is like. And so in true hackathon fashion, we have been in the spare bits of time we've had over the past couple of weeks putting some of these ideas together. And uh, yeah, hope that you um, go along this journey with us. The repo is in somewhat of a state that I hope you can follow along. Uh, there might be some live coding here and Git check-ins. Matt and I are both going to be here for this, so uh, we have a bit more flexibility in what we're going to be able to do. Um, we'll also be monitoring the um, Slack channel more than we've been able to before and kind of uh, interact with you as well. Uh, and you know, there's some places where we might tie into uh, some of the hackathon projects that are going on right now this week. Um, anything to add, Matt? Matt's furiously. I, I huh. just was a little um, perturbed by my audio feed looked a bit sketchy. Uh, so I was just checking with some people in the channel and um, looks like the video is out, but the audio is smooth for me. So I'm going to rely on folks in the channel to <laughs> tell me if things sound totally weird. Um, people are saying the video is choppy. Um, but it, I feel like it ought to be okay. At least from my side, it looks fine. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. Sorry, that was just a, a distraction. Um, back to you, Brendan. I'll let you handle it while I just keep an eye on that. Okay. Yeah. Maybe once we go off of just having the full screen, our video and uh, be presenting slides, the demands on the bandwidth will go down. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, so what do you want to do? Do you want me to switch over? That's what I've just done. Yeah, go to the presentation and... Uh... You're on. All right. Okay. Yeah. Great. So um, yes, so idea to MVP, so small Python web applications. We're going to start this from a Jupyter notebook and, and gradually build ourselves up into... What are we going to build today, Matt? Well... <laughs> You're referring to my my funny slide. So we're going to build a really terrible fossil classifier app. Um, now, I've actually it's actually already working. So if you want to see what um, at least I'm going to aim towards as a sort of punchline, I guess, or spoiler alert. If you don't like spoilers, then turn away now. Um, you can go to now. I've got a really terrible URL for this, but it's Matt Example Dot Python Anywhere. <laughs> Dot com. 
because I've already got a Python Anywhere account, but we're going to make a new one today. So, I, so that's my stupid name, Matt Example Python Anywhere .com. Now, I, hopefully, you can see me. I can't quite tell what people can see uh, at home, but I'm hoping that they can see me. So, there's if you go to slash upload on that uh, that URL, so slash upload, um, then you should see a little form with an upload button. So I'm gonna. I'm going to go choose file, and uh, I've got a. Can you see this, Brendan? I can. No, I've got a, a fossil, man. I got a yeah. I got a rock with a. Because I'm a geologist, so I just have stuff like this. This is lying around, right? I just literally reached out and picked it up, and um, I'm going to go to the camera on my phone. So there's my camera. I'm going to take a picture of this this fossil, which um, now you're mostly sort of physics, but you can tell what that is probably. Um, it's a fish. Nice. <laughs> it, is, it is a fish. I, uh, it's from Brazil. I had to use my neural network for that one. And uh, and so I'm just I'm just pressing uh, upload now, and here, here goes. So basically, we're going to build something. Look at that. Look at that. Probability of 0.38. It thinks that's a fish. So what we've basically built is sort of hot dog, not hot dog, uh, except it's not even as good as that because it doesn't really know what a not fossil is but it, it recognizes four types of fossil and um, we're gonna make that model that machine learning model um, to uh, to recognize these these four kinds of fossil and we're gonna write a web application for it and then we're gonna put that on the internet so that other people can marvel at our fossil identification skills that's awesome, and so <laughs> it really is. you know the other thing that this will that this will give everyone is a template for modifying it to do similar things or adapt it for their own needs. Uh, Matt, so some people are commenting that they cannot see your uh, your, your pretty okay. Yes, can, I uh, right. I get that now. Can make it uh, ha. This is crowdsourcing at its finest here. Yeah, I guess I have to do that. How, but how can I make how can I make click Zoom on the, look at me? Click on the window. How can I make it look at myself? Do you know what I mean? By sharing your video? Yeah. I'm sharing my video, but it only comes see. up. The thing is that well, the thing we're streaming is is my death, my view of the world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, do you have a speaker view you could show? Maybe even... I, Combine it on the desktop, like dock it maybe. Yeah. The people seem to want to uh, want to see you, Matt. Yeah, which is weird in itself. I mean, that seems to be the best I can do. I don't know how else to. Uh, I've got both of us up there now, but I'm I'm very okay. small, and I think that's all I can do. Sorry, folks. Turn the laptop around, you see the bottom of my video. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, so what's what's going to happen is uh, if you're able to visit that um, that app, you can you can see <laughs> we have been doing this all week, Evan. Yeah, um, but this is the first time we've had the person who's streaming try to speak, and I guess that was a, maybe a gap in our knowledge base. Was, so we kind of did this yesterday, though. We talked and then we had everybody on, I thought, uh, when we signed off at the Lightning Talks this morning. Yeah, and you were there. Okay, anyway, so people are asking, what's an MVP? Um, so why don't you yeah. explain yeah, that? Yeah, let's roll these slides here. So why don't All you right. sum up? Here we go. Okay, so an MVP is a minimum viable product, everyone. So this, the notion uh, of an MVP comes out of uh, sort of the lean startup methodology. So Eric Ries wrote this book uh, a number of years ago, and uh, it was it was pretty well received. Oh, Matt, I think they want you to drag the video pane down further onto the screen. You're just you're clipped off by the top of what's going on. Um. No, I don't understand that. So like the, you have the video pane uh, floating on the top right, it looks like. Can you just drag it down more towards the middle? That's OK. 
Yeah. I think we'd have this figured out by now. No, no, I mean, I, it's, I can yeah. see, okay, let's carry on. All right, let us know if that's okay, everyone. Great, yeah. so uh, it is, it's kind of a design methodology, all right? And it's, it's all about, you know, spending your design and engineering effort on the things that matter most and the way you really need to to gather information about who is going to use it or the functionality you're trying to test in the most efficient manner possible and um you know to avoid spending any effort doing things that don't need to be done um and uh yeah which is really important when you know, you're building things that are intended for other people to use, right? When you're just building stuff for, your, with, for yourself, prototyping and trying things out, you might be trying to get a library to work or just seeing if something, you know, works and so on. But as soon as you build something for something else, you're making assumptions then about how they're going to use a tool or what their workflow is. Uh, if you're building a startup, you actually want a, something that scales and solves a lot of people's problems. Uh, and, you know, you want to make sure that you've actually accurately captured in the most efficient manner possible a tool that will accomplish those things. So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about that a little bit here, um, how to plan one and how to think about it. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of paths to an MVP. There's various types of MVPs you can make depending on, you know, the application at hand. But we're going to assume here that we're, you know, in a scientific application kind of realm and you're going to build a, you know, an application that somebody's going to try. You might want to try out some UX things or, you know, answer some workflow questions or um, see how people use the tool and so on. So the two tools we're going to use to do that are, uh, are Plotly Dash and Flask, uh, both Python-based web application frameworks, dashboarding applications. Um, and uh, yeah, very flexible. Uh, and yes, they're both web apps. So Matt and I have been talking about this lately. Um, because they're becoming a more and more of a popular way to uh, deploy applications. The cloud is becoming uh, obviously uh, you know, a very dominant force in computing and the way applications are consumed and delivered and so on. So uh, these are both frameworks that, uh, that can get you to uh, the web as a deployment mechanism. You wanna add anything to that, Matt? Uh, no, <laughs> not right now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, okay. I'm fiddling with uh, trying to get myself on the screen here. Uh, okay, looks like it's okay from the last screenshot I saw. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so we've already touched on this, actually. Sorry, we put the um, acronym up before we put up the definition. Um, but uh, yes, this is the book by Eric Ries, um, and where he talks about a minimum viable product and how to how to come up with what you should put into a minimal viable product. Um, it's, on, it's all about sort of testing hypothesis. Like I think that a user needs functionality that does this. I'm gonna build something that does just that and you're gonna see how much traction you get. So, you know, the book's focused a lot on more Silicon Valley style startups, you know, social applications and so on where you can measure the effectiveness of something easily by just looking at user engagement numbers. Um, again, it's not always what we're going to be interested in doing uh, here in Swung. And as computational scientists, we're often wanting to see if you know we have something that solves a machine learning problem or you know some other problem in the subsurface. Um, but the ideas all all apply. Uh, I know on our software teams, uh, we've been using this lately to um, uh, develop tools. Lately, we've been developing tools that. Um, uh, give scientists machine learning tools to help them out with their normal workflows. And so, um, you know, that makes a lot of assumptions about what they're going to be willing to do. And if you don't have a lot of training data and you need them to label some data and so on, you know, that's a user experience that might not be pleasant if they need to do it a lot. And so, you know, we're coming up with concepts for the way users might interact with, uh, uh, a user interface to label data uh, in, in efficient and intuitive ways so that they don't get angry and wonder why they're using a tool that just made their work harder and more mundane. So, uh, yeah, so um, build, measure, and test, I think, is the main concept that's uh, that's useful there. And it's an iterative cycle, which yeah. is probably why we got that nice circle icon on the, on the cover of the book. I like that it's sort of, it's quite scientific, really. You're basically looking to validate um, right. you know, your hypotheses about 
the market. And I, I guess one of the other things I, I, I've been thinking recently is, like, although this sort of vernacular uses words like product and they talk a lot about customers and markets and um, use a lot of commercial sort of names and, and uh, words for things, you know, really it applies to almost any tool, I think, right? I mean, a product is basically a tool that people want. So um, it, it's not necessarily the case that it's going to become a thing that you go and sell. It may just be a thing that you're using to, well, sell yourself, right? To sell an idea or to get promoted or to be a, um, a noticed on the internet or, or, or what have you, or just out, out of altruism, go help your peers and um, colleagues get their work done. So the, you know, I've been trying to sort of think about instead of like a minimum viable product, a minimum viable tool is sort of the thing that once you've started hacking around with something like that's great floating around in a notebook, but really you want to put it into someone else's hands. So, you know, you can shift, I think, the whole language from products and markets and customers to sort of tools and domains and users or people I want to help. And the whole thing like still works. Because um, whether someone's, I mean, it almost doesn't matter whether they're paying for it or not, right? I mean, when it comes down to it, um, if you're delivering some kind of service in the form of help, uh, whether it's like a scientific widget or whatever, um, you're, you know, you're delivering a, you're delivering a service, and someone's sort of paying you with their attention, and uh, in, right. you know, in some cases, uh, whatever, I don't know, data, tweets, promotions, or things like that. So. Um, yeah, I think this isn't necessarily just about starting like startups and um, That's selling right. stuff. Yeah, I mean, Evan raises a good point here asking like, you know, about customers and so on. And I use that term now pretty loosely. Um, if you're a data scientist in, you know, in a company, you know, your customers are the, you know, the other people in the organization you're trying to build tools for. Uh, and so, you know, you might only have a few users or something like that. But if you know, the petrophysicist down the hall can't use a Jupyter notebook or doesn't really want to, you can, you know, build them a web app with an intuitive interface that lets them use the models you built um, to, uh, to help them out with their day to day. So totally. Yeah. Good. All right. What's next? Idea to MVP. Yeah, I mean, I, with the idea here was really just to talk about a little bit of the language that's floating around out there. And I don't want to like, you know, <laughs> this isn't sequence stratigraphy. We don't need to sit around arguing about what words mean. Um, but, <laughs> it, you know, people talk about proofs of concept and uh, prototypes and so on. And for me, there's just this sort of chain of sort of having an idea um, to seeing if that idea can work or not. Like, is it even a valid proposal? Uh, to then building something that sort of is the most basic possible thing that says, yeah, you could actually build a tool that does that, but you would never give it to someone or show it to anybody. And maybe it's still in a Jupyter notebook or whatever. Uh, and then there's an MVP or an MVT, like your minimum viable tool that you would actually share with another person and uh, use it as a way to get feedback about it. Like concrete, not just like, hey, what do you think of this idea? But like, no, here's this thing, go and try it, uh, you know, and, and and if the feedback is, oh, no, I didn't use it, then, you know, you, you may have missed the mark, at least with that person. So um, immediately you start getting good data. And what, you know, one of the things I, I think I have to keep reminding myself sort of thing is that you really can't afford at that point um, to... Um, <laughs> essentially be in love with your idea or in love with the technology that you've used to, to sort of implement it so much that you can't let go of things when people tell you that they don't like it. And um, one of the things that Steve Blank and Derek Reese say about startup stuff is, you know, no business model survives first contact with the customer. And really no tool is ever going to survive first contact with your prospective users. So you've got to be prepared at that point to pivot and, yeah, change, uh, what, you know, your idea of what's what's appropriate in the space. Um, and then after product, well, product is always just the first step anyway. I mean, it never stops, right, this iteration cycle. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you uh, turn back to that in a couple of slides, Matt. Um, I think that's great. Um, you know, just a thought from, from 
you know, that other definition of customers being anyone like inside your company that wants to use this. Uh, a lot of times we encounter some hesitation for some of the, you know, new digital technologies that are out there affecting workflows and so on. Like people are like, ah, that machine learning stuff, we tried that years ago, it doesn't work, I'm not interested. Yeah. Releasing early and often and incremental pieces of functionality like this can make people more comfortable with your ideas and help you to sell them and work with you and get kind of buy-in and give you their thoughts and feedback for uh, for how it could be a more general tool, which I think can be really useful. Um, you know, at least in the in the energy industry, in the oil and gas industry, from what I've observed, like sometimes there's data science teams who you know get a special floor and you know you know these high concept research projects, but they don't really get any useful products in a reasonable timeline to the hands of everybody in it kind of it's you know it's generally just bad for morale so you know a uh, design iteration like this can get people constantly uh you know using the tool um it's, that's not a big jump from where they are right now and successfully you know iteratively layer in more functionality yeah totally um so i think we should um i think we should get into it at this point like we we may come back to these slides later but i mean i think there's just there's some talking points in there people can feel free to i don't know did did you draw attention to the URL um, earlier on? If not, I'll drop it in the uh, um, um, chat if no one did already. Here. Uh, the URL is on the first slide here, everyone. Yeah, Yeah. sorry, but I've got, we're in the way. Ching. I'll, okay. I'll drop it in here too. But yeah, why don't we flip over to some actual code? I think that'll be fun. To some code? Yeah. Okay. Great. So I think I'll start out because what I did, I did a notebook um, looking at some some data exploration and some dimensionality reduction, simple things, um, but just to show you the progression from you know Jupiter to to uh, to Dash. But Matt, maybe I'll get you to talk about the data set a little bit because it's pretty interesting. Um, I think let me see here. Yeah, look, I put up a here's a folder of some of the images in Fossil Okay. Matt. okay. Um... Yeah, sure. Uh, well, how are you going to, did you get some download code in the end or no? Working. It's working. Yeah. Let's just oh, put okay. it that way. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're, we're going to, uh, should give you links to this data set um, at uh, sh shortly, I guess. I, I won't go and dig it out right now. Um, Steve Purvis was using it, I think this morning, perhaps. I didn't, I haven't seen his uh, tutorial yet. Did he use this, Brendan? Maybe not. I'm not sure I was... Okay, you, you were asleep, yet, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, because we've been flailing around a little bit with it, with it today, just in case you downloaded this repo before and you see that the fossils have gone now from it, because we've been trying to build something which is a bit of a benchmark. Now, I, this may not be the appropriate data set, but at least... It's, it's a start, so let's see what happens to it. I've called it FossilNet. Um, it contains 3,000 images, natural photographs of fossils in 10 classes. Um, so it's a little bit sort of modeled on the CIFAR 10 uh, data set sort of idea. Oh, there's nowhere near in as many uh, images, obviously. It's already split into um, uh, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. Um, so in those three yeah. folders there. And um, I don't remember the proportions off the top of my head, but you can easily poke around and have a look at how many there are in those. The test and val are the same size. And all of them are just pulled off the internet. So they are a mixture of open access and copyright, all rights reserved images. However, these ones uh, are quite small. So they're only 224 pixels uh, on the maximum, on the sort of largest dimension. And I believe that that coupled with some of the other things we've done are sufficient to claim that the our use of these images is fair is fair it's fair use it falls under the fair use doctrine so um that's why i'm that's my assertion i guess uh, you may or may not disagree with me if you disagree don't use this data set um it's yeah so the and it's difficult it's a difficult data set they these are not laboratory photographs of uh, fossils. Some of them are with uh, scales and things like that in them, uh, but many of them are from the field or from museums or from like a fossil in somebody's hand. Um, 
if you try and build a classifier on it naively, you'll get a very low score. Um, I think it's going to be quite difficult to do well at this data set. And it may be too difficult. I don't know. That's an open question, I guess. Um, anyway, this is what we're going to be using. So there's a couple of documents yeah. in there that explain the rights and so on as well. Yeah, I briefly popped up the, uh, you know, the rights thing. And uh, yeah, if you're looking for open data, if you ever want to if you ever want to know if it's open, you can just email Matt and ask him. At least that's what I do. That's my MVP for a, is this a good <laughs> open classifier. Okay, so yeah, we're going to be using four classes from uh, from this data set right now in our initial classifier. So um, yes, the first notebook. So this one is called Data Exploration Clustering. Um, and uh, and here we go. So yeah, this week's been a bit of a hackathon on this stuff. So, uh, you know, there's probably lots of little fixes and there might even be some live errors that happen. Um, what? But in any case, yeah, you'll get to see us, uh, you know, thinking through the problem here. But um, yeah, here is some code to download the fossil net database from um, the S3 bucket. Uh, I was having problems with this earlier, but I had already had a local copy. That's a you know URL. You click on that and download it directly as well. Uh, do you want to just? Oh, good. Someone's just make it totally clear which notebook you're in here, just in case folks mix, missed that. Yes, data exploration. Oh, I have that over there. <laughs> Clustering. Ipynv. Now, if you downloaded the repo, if you cloned the repo yesterday, this wouldn't have been in there. So you'd want to pull pull down the recent changes. So very good. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna step through this. I'm just gonna do some simple stuff with this. So we get a new machine learning problem. Uh, you wanna explore the data a little bit, understand how the features relate to what you're trying to classify and uh, you know, build some intuition on how to proceed. So we're not gonna be doing any kind of real feature engineering here or model design really. Uh, and that is actually a great place to start. Speaking of MVPs, um, you know, we could dig into this and start making an awesome PyTorch, you know, convolutional network classifier, stacked, you know, classifier, magic thing that, um, yeah, that Lucas would be, you know, all excited about. But, um, and that's probably what you're gonna wanna do to get the best scores on this. But if you're just trying to explore things and especially teach it, uh, it's best to start simple uh, and kind of establish a baseline and get a feel for how things look. And so, yeah, we're gonna be using a simple random forest here and, and just the simple pixel intensities uh, as features. So uh, yeah, this first block of code um, kind of organizes the database. So it reads through the different directories, pulls out the training data and the validation data in this case. We won't be using the validation data, Matt will be showing that. And oh, of course I didn't run the cell above. So um, run, run Jupyter Notebook cells in order. Uh, just looking at the training data. So there is 1600 images in the training data. Uh, we have um, we've down sampled them into 32 by 32 um, Squares, yeah. They get, so they, they've squares, been squeezed, squares. in fact, some of them. Yep, they've been squeezed. I'll show you an example one in a sec. And grayscaled, right, Matt? That's right, yeah. So it's it, like yeah. we've removed a lot of Single information. Chain. Yeah, so here's one with a, um, a an example of one. That looks like a, a leaf or something. Um, very good. So that's the data that we're looking at. So 1600s of those. And then, you know, for the training data, we just flattened that out to have um, 10,024 features. So really simply, that's what we're going to be uh, using. So the good thing, Matt, that uh, comes from starting with a baseline like this, and, and, and we haven't really talked about this before, but, you know, it was coming to mind as I was doing this is, you know, I wrote a notebook once that had a really simple model and a simple baseline as well and sent mm -hmm. it to you one time on machine learning. I remember that. So, you know, perhaps there's a contest or something like that that might arise from FossilNet. If there's not some, yeah, if there's not some sort of jousting contest, I'll be a little bit disappointed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, like I say, um, I, I think it is going to take quite a bit of complexity to solve this, uh, this classification 
well at all. Um, so I'm, I'm in definitely interested to see what people manage to do. Yeah, great. <laughs> but it's not going to be us, not today anyway. <laughs> it's not going to be today. No, I'm going to need some sleep after this. But um, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see what the baselines are. And there's, you know, there's tons of ways we could take this. In fact, you know, I had to restrain some of the things I wanted to show and play with to, to get this together. Um, but in any case, so, you know, visualizing the feature space and how it separates in various ways uh, could be useful for just seeing what's, you know, what, what the properties of the features that you've extracted are. So we're just going to do uh, use a couple different uh, dimensionality reduction techniques or um, data visualization techniques to, to view this. So, so UMAP uh, is a popular uh, dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm. Uh, it's a separate Python package. Uh, I believe it's in the uh, in the environment CML file, so you can see how to install it. I think it's just a pip install umap or uh, a conda forge equivalent. But um, we can we can run this, and it will go and crank out those features. And what it does is it reduces that um, thousand twenty four um, dimension feature space down to two dimensions. And you can already see the plot kind of up here right now. Uh, and uh, it projects it um, onto those two dimensions. So you can see some interesting things from this data set right now that, um, that the four AMs actually, these green dots, do tend to um, cluster you know, in a lobe to one side of this, this overall structure of features here. There's some green ones uh, dispersed throughout this center region. Uh, and the dinosaurs, fishes, and trilobites are kind of mixed up, you know, in the middle here. So, you know, I think we'll see that manifest itself when we build some classifiers to um, to visualize this data. So we're just playing around with things right now. We've got a Jupyter notebook, uh, Matplotlib uh, visualization, just to see what's going on. But a visualization like this now can help us to um see if we come up with another feature if we put you know want you know to try uh, some convolutional features on this uh, pre-trained convolutional neural network or a wavelet scattering transform or something we can visualize we can use umap to visualize the space of those features and see if um let's see if the appropriate clusters start to segregate out anymore we might get that uplift from that t -SNE is another algorithm uh, i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right. I don't know if I've ever even said it out loud before, but uh, uh, bless you. Is it? Yeah. Is that, is that right, Matt? Is that what? That's, I think that's what the cool kids say. Yeah. So what data scientists say? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can, we can run this. I put the timer on this for some reason. I think it was taking a little longer and I wanted to see what happened. But uh, away it goes and runs, and uh, we'll also compute a two-dimensional projection of the data, which uh, which we can look at here. A little bit of trickery in the matplotlib code to um, plot each of these with the appropriate categorical color label, but uh, you can see how we did that. So actually quite similar properties to the, to the UMAP uh, classifier, um, perhaps a bit more spread out in this low part, but... Um, I don't know how to really interpret these things beyond that, Matt. If you have anything to say, it's kind of a visual guide to how these uh, features project themselves onto these weird manifolds. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, pe people always say, well, you shouldn't use these spaces aren't like metric spaces, so you shouldn't sort of um, use the proximity between things as, you know, any kind of, like you shouldn't use the output from a Tisney, I think, as a, as features for a classifier um i'm sure i tried steve, that it didn't work out that well steve will correct me if i'm if i'm wrong but this this is what i hear and uh, but on the other hand if things don't separate in these u maps and tisneys then it's really hard to see how they're ever gonna you know right. be separable i mean when you look at um uh what is it the um you know, like the MNIST data set, for example, the handwritten digits, I mean, it separates beautifully in a TISNI. So. Okay, yes, I've seen that example out there. So uh, Steve says that, you know, he did use this data set in his tutorial this morning and he got the best score also. Yeah. That's pretty I good. Think, I think he was, that was a, that's a challenge, man. Yeah. That's a shot across the bow. It seems to be. Yeah. I'm not going head to head right. to it's Steve. It's on, though. everyone. <laughs> It's on everyone. This contest lasts as long as this tutorial. 
<laughs> but, uh, but hang on though, he, he's, he is also only using those four classes. Like it's, it's yeah. Has like, he used up all the, all, all the GPU time he got from Amazon? <laughs> it's gone now. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, okay, I also just wanted another one. I, I did a PCA, Principal Component Analysis, uh, and played around with it. Uh, you know, you can feed in the number of components that you want. I'm only going to use two just to project it onto a two-dimensional surface and just do another matplotlib plot. Great. So uh, we've seen what this data set looks like when we project it into these spaces. Uh, maybe we've learned something. Maybe we haven't. But you know, as a reusable tool, you know, it's not all that great of a user interface, right? Like someone has to kind of run this notebook, you got these three different plots and it's kind of hard to compare. So we might want to build a little tool that lets us uh, look at um, you know, these different projections in a more efficient way. And so um, this is where Plotly and Plotly's dash come in, at least how I've been using it. Now, um, there are a lot I shouldn't say lots. There's quite a few tools out there now that you can do interactive um, graphics with embedded in Jupyter Notebooks, um, uh, Bokeh, um, uh, and so on. And so this is just one of them. Um, uh, you know, you kind of have to pick one. I tend to go for things that have a lot of examples online and that I can see people talking about because like I learn everything on Stack Overflow uh, these days. Um, you know, so we're, you know, and especially with matplotlib, I think there's a, there's like a law of stack overflow matplotlib threads that, um, uh, every matplotlib thread on stack overflow will ev eventually end in a question answered by Joe Kington. <laughs> uh, at least that's been my, that's been my experience, uh, at least the ones that I've looked for, but, um, right. So here's that, uh, the UMAP, um, projection visualized in Plotly. So it's uh, even more of a straightforward call to, to get that plot out. And you can see Plotly is already giving you some interactivity, right? So you, you can get these tool tips that uh, show you more information about the, uh, the points that you mouse over. Uh, and this is customizable as well. Uh, if you want to add more detail, I'll actually show you an example of that when we put it in a dashboard. Um, uh, but you have tools here. So zoom tools and um, and so on that you can use to uh, interrogate this, uh, this data set. Steve's throwing down on there, uh, Matt. Yeah. Do you use Plotly like all the time or do you, are you still mostly Matplotlib, would you say? I am in transition. I think I default to Matplotlib just from a habit. Hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I definitely do. And uh, the thing is, I'm never thinking I'm, not, I'm perhaps not in the habit of thinking far enough ahead to think, actually, if I ever want to do something with this, it's going to be way shorter right. path to victory if I just start off in Plotly or whatever. Um, and I, you know, right. I'm, I tend to go low level on everything and just, yeah, as you'll see later. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. You know, I so I guess when Plotly was first out, I there wasn't much documentation and I did find it kind of hard to use. And so I didn't use it very much. But, um, you know, recently when I started to look into Dash, I got back into Plotly and uh, have been finding it fairly straightforward to use. So this will come up later, but I was asking folks in one of the hackathon groups this morning how to add uh, sort of a secondary axis on one of these plots. and. There wasn't much documentation about it online and, and it wasn't that easy to do. So, uh, um, yes, we did. There's your fish, Matt, <laughs> in your rock. It was there the whole time. It's the, it's the projection. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful. Good. So, um, <laughs> All right, so here's the Plotly view of this. I'm just showing you this because these Plotly plots can be dropped pretty much directly into a Dash application. So uh, I'll digress a moment here to talk about Dash. So this was um, this is Plotly's framework for developing um, you know, data science web applications, and uh, you know I found them pretty useful for. Uh, um, for scientific applications, uh, you know, as I'll kind of show you here, and, on. and I have another example that's um, not the fossil net that some of you might find relevant as well. 
So I'm going to be using uh, something relatively new that came out uh, in the Dash suite of tools, which is called Jupyter Dash, which lets you um, build and define uh, these um, Dash applications right inside a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and so um, here it is. This is the entire application. And what I want to do is I want to have one of these plots that's let, that lets you select which projection that you want to view. So not just TSNE, maybe you want to look at uh, the PCA or the, or the UMAP um, uh, projection and toggle back and forth between them. And so, so that's what this is going to do. So my introduction to this was actually following the tutorial on the Dash website. So I can click over here to the Dash layout real quick. Make my text bigger. I learned about that this week. And you know, this Dash tutorial is really quite good for giving you the basics um, uh, of how to use Dash. And uh, talking about the, real, the various components. So the first one is the Dash layout. All right. And Dash apps are written all in Python. You don't have to worry about uh, JavaScript or Flask or those kinds of things to make these apps. As you can see, like I showed you that code, it was just one, um, you know, one Python file uh, that contains all of the code that you have to write. Um, and it is running Flask on the back end. And so this is going to tie nicely, I think, into what Matt's going to present next. Uh, and, and, and you can actually use the two together to make more complicated applications. So you know, the more you learn, the, 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 this, will, this will wear well with your experience. Um, yeah, I'll come back to this. So let me yeah, walk through this a little bit. So I've imported some of the Dash dependencies. Uh, there's sort of two components to these Dash apps. There's one where you sort of describe the layout uh, of where everything is and define the sort of web page artifacts that you want to define the structure of the application. So there's um, you know an HTML div that kind of contains uh, the application. I have a title here. I'm going to have a graph that's going to show the scatter plot um, uh, for the different projections. There's a title. And then I'm going to have one control box. Okay, this is a drop-down menu uh, that's going to have uh, three options in it: UMAP, TSNE, or PCA. And this is just the syntax for how I'm going to select it. So there's a layout component of these apps, and then there's callbacks that you define that trigger. Uh, when the user interacts with, with these menu items. And so every time this, um, this projection dropdown gets activated or changes, this callback is going to be called, and it's going to generate a new figure object based on you know, whatever changed and, and return that to the application, and it'll show it. So in this case, it's just going to uh, return, you know, generate a plot with the projection that the, that the user selected. Okay. You call app.runServer uh, with uh, mode equals inline to generate that application right inside the Jupyter Notebook. So here's my Dash app right inside. It doesn't quite fit in this frame here, but move down a little bit. Uh, yeah, so we can interact with this. So you can see this is a plotly plot. Uh, it's got my title. It's got uh, uh, you know sort of a subtitle for this plot. And then there's a window down here that lets me select different projections. So UMAP is selected right now. Hmm. There's the TSNE projection and, uh, and the PCA. So pretty simple, but yeah. not a lot of uplift to actually have a web app. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, it's, it, it, <laughs> it's kind of meta, isn't it, putting it... Wait, so there was a plotly plot, a plotly plot, and then right. you can put that into Dash and it'll put it in a web app. And now we've put that into like an iframe, I guess, inside the Jupyter Notebook, I, I guess is what's happening. But do you do, how, I did, I sort of missed what you had to do to do that last bit. Like what's the difference, I guess, between this as Dash and this as Jupyter Dash? Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it's pretty similar. I think it just Jupyter Dash has the plumbing to make the dash app appear as an in an iframe in yeah. the below this cell. So where did wh because which is the line in in that cell above here or the one that I guess yeah. that's attached to this app? But which one says okay we're doing this in Jupiter? How does how, why didn't it start up a, uh, a dash server somewhere? 
I guess. You're... So it has. There's a yeah, there's right. a Dash server running on localhost in the background here, okay. and I think that the Jupyter Dash stuff hooks it up to this cell and makes knows that this is the iframe that'll be getting it. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, and mm. that's actually running in the background. If I go and try to start up another um, Dash app on localhost on the default port, it'll collide with this and it'll come up with an error. So okay, you need to restart the kernel or change the port number. Uh, and like something else. <laughs> I guess I'm. A little bit on the fence about the like I, I like the dash stuff i'm a bit on the fence about the jupiter dash stuff that starts to feel like it's sort of all folding in back on itself now i want my jupiter dash thing in a in an app where people can change the i don't know um yeah but but so, it's definitely for, for me this is just a is, is it like for yeah. developing it seems like it would be quite useful if you're used to being in this sort of environment yeah i think if you I wouldn't want to do a complicated Dash app here, uh, but you know you can. It's weird, and that, this probably would get messy. But you know, this all this stuff doesn't have to be in the same Jupyter window, right? Like, I mean, you could sort of build these in blocks and change them and experiment with different things. You know, sure, yeah, yeah, Jupyter-ish fashion, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, I wonder if I, right, I wouldn't mind. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask the. Um, the the room uh, what are we calling this the channel that sort of descended into i had to stop reading it at one point <laughs> it was, yeah, anyway uh if anyone knows if there's a way to run a flask i almost hesitate to ask this because it sounds weird and potentially gross but to to run a flask app inside an iframe like this in jupiter um I don't know. Well, it's, it's, essence, isn't that, that's what's happening. That is what's happening. I mean, that's what this is. Yeah. But, um, right. you know, because we teach a, 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 a unit on Flask and because we're teaching people who have spent almost all of their time up to that point in Jupyter, you know, it's a Jupyter right. notebook, but you actually are putting it all in a script so that you can go run Flask properly. Um, but I yeah. suppose it, I can't decide if it would be helpful or totally confusing to have your web pages showing up in a Jupyter notebook. I think it might be confusing. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, that's a really good point. Actually, I haven't, I only really played with this, uh, this part of this tutorial because of the Jupyter to prototype sort of progression. I see. Uh, and so, yeah, because you don't have to do the extra step of, I don't know, running the app from the command line or something, which I'm going to show how to do anyways. Um, Okay, Matt, a couple different modes and one and one that you asked for, okay? So I'm gonna comment out the inline app run and show the external mode. And what this will do is it's going to, it starts up the server uh, kind of like normal and runs it in a separate tab. So uh, I can click on right. that and it opens up a new browser tab with the application in it there. So it's being launched and programmed from the Jupyter Notebook, but now I'm seeing it more like I would see it if I was going to deploy it. Yeah, so, so so show me the change you made to do that. Yeah, so that was just going from uh, mode equals inline to mode equals external. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. But then it's almost like that's almost the same then, is it not? Okay, you you could have run that dash stuff in from a script then at that point, and then it would have fired up yes. and you'd open your browser. So this is a way to, I yep. like that. That's yeah. right. I think. Yep. If I basically, yeah, changing this Jupyter dash line to dash uh, and starting the app differently would, it's a carbon copy otherwise to paste this into a script. And I think that's what you would do. Yeah. Uh, and Michael's, we, Michael Harty's we, saying they had the same chat this morning in the hackathon team and they're leaning towards standalone, which I, th I think he probably means leaning towards like un unclipped from Jupyter, which. Right. It's intuitively where I feel sort of comfortable. Um, but I can see how if you've, you know, Jupiter's sort of more and more almost like an IDE for people who don't want to maybe go into, you know, VS Code or, uh, or whatever, um, then you've kind of got it all right there. So, yeah, nice. Yeah. Mateo's saying he's a bit behind catching up. He... Oh, let me check out what's happening. Problem there. with that. Um, it, he's at the top of the notebook though. So, uh, anyways, um, okay. Well, this next line actually I wanted you to see, 
uh, because you know it might be the case where you want to share this with somebody and this is running on localhost so it's only you know can be seen by um, your this own com computer oh. so I'm gonna run this final command and uh, run it actually on uh, uh, out on the, my network okay and so if you know the IP address of the computer you're using so I'm on the Linux box here I just ran um, IF config and went to look at my you know my IP, internal network IP address which is 192.168.1.117 on port 8080 and plug that into any other computer or device on this network and can bring it up so I just brought that up in my my phone IP address you can see everyone and that's you know sharing from from here so this is the dash app here so I can you know mess around with this plot and you know look at different things and so on and uh, you know experiment with that so this is a quick way to if you're a hackathon or something like that uh, that you could share uh, the apps with people and get them to test and try things out. Is that what you were asking me, Matt, earlier? Uh, yeah, about um, sp specifying the, uh, the, the, the host. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So very straightforward to do in, in the application. Uh, very good. So yeah, this next part's really quick. I did a bit of clustering on the on the data set. So I just ran this through k-means to see what that looked like. There's a plotly plot showing the, the results. Uh, I think it's weird that I'm clustering on the full data set on Xtrain and but showing the clusters with this in sort of UMAP space and it, you know, they follow along pretty clear lines. Crazy. Um, but uh, this is with four clusters. What if you wanted more and to see what those differences are? So I did a, just a real another real quick app uh, that lets you play with the number of k-means clusters you'd like to find, and you can drag this kind of wherever you want, and uh, it'll do that computation, and you can view it. You can pick which projection you want it onto, so it kind of builds on the last one. All so, right. Hmm. Interesting to see the way these classes project themselves around these uh, these reduced dimensionality spaces. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Huh. That's cool. It's uh, it's I... nice for building intuition about clustering algorithms because they they do all work in you know slightly different ways and they're not necessarily right. Um, you know, you can definitely make the wrong decision about a, what which one's appropriate for a given data set because of the sort of implicit assumptions, um, you know, in k-means, for example. Um, and I think being able to visualize them like that and slide something around is so, it's so nice for building intuitions about stuff where you can do mental experiments and have them play out immediately. Right. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, good. So, yeah, so that is kind of an intro to to some of these plotting tools and dashboarding capabilities. And so I also have an example of of a of a dash app in a script, um, slightly more complicated, uh, not with this data set. It's with something else uh, relevant though to subsurfacely inclined folks. And I'll just switch to that quick. Are we doing okay on time, Matt? Yeah, we're great. Okay, great. So let's see here. Right. Okay, good. So let me make sure that's active. So here is my VS Code window. That's my that's my uh, IDE of choice these days. I, I was an Emacs guy for a while, but you know, I I got away from it for a while, and going back to it just gave me hand cramps. So. Um, VS Code is surprisingly good. I've really been uh, enjoying enjoying using it. So this is an application that's going to be an interactive cross-plotting tool, OK? And so this should be in the repo um, and uh, under the dash directory. I have an example in there. Uh, it's called plugexplore.py. The entire app is in that file. And then it's going to use the two data files that are in that directory as well. Uh, sorry, I know it's somewhat bad form to put data into a GitHub repository, but 
mirror tight for time and they're not that big so um so on we go <laughs> um yeah so i'm going to launch this app first and i'll kind of come back to it and show what it does so in my in my console down here in my terminal window i've got my um, transform python environment activated i'm going to launch this application so it starts up a flask server and uh, it actually says it's starting flask uh, on that on that interface and uh and there we go i had to specify a different port here just so i wouldn't collide with anything i left running in the jupyter notebook and i will control click to follow that and boom my little plug data explorer app pops up so what this is is uh all of the this is rca data from one of the wells in the poseidon data set this is the pharos well so i don't did this not make it in somewhere i this is a creative commons licensed data set uh from conical phillips geoscience australia put this up i'll fix that in post. Sorry about that. But yeah, this is one of our open data sets. You can get to it on the data underground too. the link from uh, the software underground website. And I love this data set, especially for petrophysics uh, and core work. Uh, I've used it for for quite a few things uh, and at hackathons before. Uh, and one of the things I've been wanting to do for a while is make a way to explore the data that's in there in a more intuitive way and to access it and see what's going on. Uh, so in any case, there's some Excel spreadsheets uh, with uh, routine core analysis data. So they took plugs out and they measured porosity and permeability and grain density. And that's what we're plotting here. So this is a cross plot uh, showing showing those two, uh, so I'm showing these parameters that come from that data set. Um, yeah, so you can control what's on the different axes. So X axis right now is porosity, you have grain density and depth you can also show. So uh, that'll mess around with that. Uh, if you know, depth, it's, it's tied to uh, you know there's a that plot function is will change what parameters shown on the different axes. You can control whether linear or log scale is used and so on. Um, yeah, this is an interactive plot. So I did some more with the tool tips here as well. So as you mouse over these things, you can see what sample number it is and what the exact values for all of the all of the different measurements are. Um, I made an app for a project actually that's something like this that I needed to figure out what was going on with outliers. Uh, it was doing some machine learning. And so if something wasn't being classified right, I kind of wanted to see where the plug was. And so I had thin sections and uh, images associated with these various plugs too, where I could click on it and pop up the thin section and figure out what might be going on with the classifier, what additional training data uh, I need. So uh, yeah, Kieran's right. There's SCAL data for some of these wells too. Um, I think there's some in the repo and and I'd like to do something with it. There's is, This is just a start. Um, this was a something I put together from some other code this morning actually during the lightning talk. So hopefully it doesn't break. Um, Right, this plot here on the right. So this is a call out to my plot lead well viz <laughs> peeps that are working hard on that. So this is my bad well log and the one I was asking you about today where I wanted two axes on it. So it only has one axis on it right now, but it gets the point across. Um, perhaps, you know, you can use this and modify it for, uh, for the hackathon this weekend, uh, or I'll try to help out if I can. But um, you, can, you can select points on here. So sometimes you might actually want to see visually where where groups of points uh, are in the core or something. So I'm going to grab my lasso tool, which is kind of lets me draw a region here. I'm going to select these points. And they're highlighted uh, over here now on this plot on the right hand side. So um, sorry, this blue curve is the core gamma. Uh, and, uh, and the reds are showing the permeability of all these points. I apologize. That's what I wanted the two axes for. But, um, but yeah, so they're highlighted now. So you can see that, oh, okay, these groups of points actually come from lower down in the core from this region here. If you had core images or um, uh, other things you wanted to compare with, you could find them, maybe see what's going on. So double click on that to, to reset. But uh, yeah, so for, for not much code, you, know, you can uh, have a fairly interactive tool that lets you explore the data set in this way. Yeah. Of course, you can color this, apply facies analysis, clustering, and so on. Is it possible to um, 
sort of like when when you select some points there um yeah can you then like export that like save and export those labels or like read them in your um in your session somehow are they accessible yeah when you grab these points yeah yeah so these points get sent basically as a list um i think keyed by their ids or something to a callback function right oh yeah Which, right okay so that's good so that's a good question so let's jump into the code over here um and uh, and walk down here so <laughs> did you like my software underground logo up here in the top right matt oh i think you know what i think i might be hiding it with uh your face oh look at that wow that is awesome <laughs> here we go yeah. yeah we got we got the logo there <laughs> nice um right so there is a let's see if i jump down to the callback here yeah so the cross plot you know as a tool will generate selected data sort of events once you complete a selection event and anything that's listening to that so this one's registered as listening to data being selected in that cross plot it'll fire this up and it gets this selected data parameter Mm -hmm. that um, I'm doing stuff with here. So if the data is in this, I'm basically giving it um, no no opacity. If it's not in there, you're getting a opacity of 0.2. Now, if this is probably this is this is probably me getting confused again about Jupyter Dash. But if you were doing this in a Jupyter Dash, could could you then interactively? interact with those uh like interrogate those points and go off in your on your merry way in jupiter going oh okay i've got these points now i can uh do you know what i mean because when you write the callback you already sort of had to know what you were going to do yeah when when they when you selected them and triggered it mm -hmm. but, but can i use it sort of interactively which you, which you can do right with uh matplotlib even i think you can you yeah know, have some mouse events and get some points and then carry them off down your on your merry way in your Jupyter notebook. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, I haven't done any callbacks that weren't tied to sort of generating a new plot. Yeah, uh, and taking input from other plots. And so, you know, this is the sort of syntax of, of one of these callbacks. So use this decorator app dot callback, right? And it takes two parameters. First one is the output that it generates. So, so this function will generate a plot of that type, and then a list of the of the inputs that will trigger this thing to fire. And so, maybe you can put in, you know, different things for outputs. I know when I was debugging an app once, um, I was outputting just to a div, and spitting out text, almost like a kind of like a weird print statement just to see what was in objects and things like that. So I was interacting with it that way. So you probably could do that in Jupyter as well. Yeah, right. No, that's cool. Yeah. You know, you're often like... Good. I mean, you've got to be careful, haven't you, with interactive stuff because it's sort of not reproducible. Um, you know, so you wouldn't want to necessarily Correct. go off and do some kind of critical analysis that had, result, had depended on you picking this particular polygon. Um, but if right. you could spit out the polygon... And capture its, you know, its position, and label the points, and you know, maybe go off and save those. Then that, I think that could be an interesting way to blend, basically start letting, make it a bit easier to bring interpretation into these workflows, um, and judgment, right? right? Uh, but but st still somehow have them be on record, as it were. Like, what did I do to That's do that? That's correct. So you're right. Yeah, when you have a UI like that, there's some unreproducible aspects. But you're bringing up an important point in designing tools like this with UIs, right? Is that you can't actually always know what, you know, what the user's going to click on. Hmm. Uh, and so that's uh, that's something to consider, um, you know, when you're doing tet I mean, te when you're testing uh, and uh, yeah, and designing those applications. You can write unit tests that kind of simulate user interactions, but you know, the user can do anything, not just what's in your regression test. So, yeah, I mean, it just feels, especially, you know, I'm thinking back to say Joe's um, 
tutorial yesterday where you know he's doing things like picking the toe of slope for example on a bathymetry um, raster right. and the way he was doing it, it was completely reproducible because he's basically just making decisions about thresholds and how you know skeleton parameters and stuff like that um, and, I, and I really like that way of working um, you know as well so anyway we could go into a long conversation about that but I guess what I was just thinking was you know, as we get more into workflows where we're talking about, say, labeling things for machine learning, um, it, you know, this, the, I mean, the jury is out basically on how those labels should be generated and propagated and whether we should be using human labels and, uh, or, or, you know, synthetic labels and things like this. Um, but it just strikes me that w when you're in the exploratory phase of something, it would be nice to have the flexibility right. of like, well, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but let me see what happens when I paint this thing up here. Um, it, yeah. I'd love to see an uh, interactive, okay, what if I train with this, uh, with these pixels highlighted? What if I train my unit now? Okay, this happens. Okay, what if I train with these pixels? What about now? You know, whereas right, right now I feel like it's yep. very much a pipeline. Like I have to go back to the thing and pick different pixels and then go all the way back through training. Um, but I can see Plotly ah. maybe a pl letting you build something that's a bit more like, you know, uh, yeah, this more of this intuition training we were talking about. So, yeah, you raise a good point. So, yeah, we do talk about that a lot because, you know, a lot of machine learning workflows in the data science perspective, when you learn something online, it's kind of a static thing. You have a fixed set of training data, you know, you run it through your pipeline, you get a model, you get a result. And the things you're changing are often the model parameters or your feature engineering and things like that. To make a tool for people to use, and oftentimes to make an interpretation, you're requiring them to interact, you know, and label things a little bit and so on. And you can never quite be guaranteed how they're going to label things and whether that's going to be correct with respect to the rest of your training model or whatever you're doing. And so that's that's a big change, I think, from. Um, you know, from from the prototype stage, jumping to reusable ML and at least machine learning enabled tools and so on. Very good. So yeah, some good points on there. Michael is bringing up a point as well. You know, getting in deeper about how um, I think I think what like what he's one of the things he's input, implying is how can we build like robust featureful applications uh, with Dash that remembers things like selections and state outside of that immediate callback and so on. Um, so yeah, I don't really have any cut and dry answers yet. I've been wondering them myself. Uh, and so that'd be good to see, but, uh, this data set, there's last files for this well and so on online. I'd love to see what we could plot up here on the right hand side and, and, uh, you know, enhance this. Uh, I think that would be, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. I might poke my head in this weekend if I, if I can. Very good. So I don't know if I need to touch on this much more. The the it's a little bit more complicated. Some of these functions, you can see how I'm creating the tooltips and how I'm how this interaction is working. Uh, there's probably some silly mistakes, um, some margin stuff. You know, I was just trying to get this to lay out and not look all silly. But uh, but yeah, this is this is a canonical Dash app in a script um, that can get launched. And so. Um, the same trick we'll use uh, can be used if you want to expose this on your local network. If you're interested in deploying this to the web, and Matt's going to show you a way to do that, but there's a pretty straightforward tutorial on the Dash website that shows you how to deploy this on Heroku, for example, uh, uh, which is a sort of an app service probably built on top of AWS. Um, and there's plenty of tutorials out for how to you know, deploy Dash apps on AWS as well. Uh, and, and as Matt pointed out to me, actually, um, Equinor has open sourced some libraries that use, that are layer on top of Dash to make deployment easier uh, and more reproducible, um, sort of automatically containerizing everything. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't actually don't have that link right ready to pop up, but I'll be willing to sec. Yeah, yeah I think I... To, well, I mean, well, here's Equinor's current uh, GitHub. I mean, 320 repos at this point. Like, this company is... Um, Props to Equinor. Yeah, it's it's awesome. 
and remarkable. And and when you talk to people like you know Jokfa about this, you know they seem to have, they have made a decision. I think to go open by default. So they need a reason essentially to keep things closed source. And uh, they really seem to be trying to be awesome digital citizens. So um, I really encourage you to explore in here and help. I mean, I'd love it if this community could help sort of reward them essentially by with attention and whatever PRs and interest, um, because I don't see anyone else in the sort of subsurface space um, acting like this. And, you know, yeah, they're well trying to remodel themselves as an energy company. And I think doing a decent job of that, too. They're really investing a lot in uh, wind, especially. Um, right. But they recognize that the energy transition is is happening. And um, like I alluded to the other day, may even be over. Um, so, um, yeah, some really interesting things in here. But if you search around uh, now, I don't know how much uh, searching I really want to do, but WebViz was the, um, there we go. So, whoops, sorry, not maintained anymore. But they've got all these other WebViz uh, spin-offs, if you like. Uh, like WebViz Subsurface, um, WebViz Config, and this, yeah, Core. There's some for particular fields, which I'm not sure that we have the data for. Um, but anyway, uh, really interesting. Can you post the link? Yeah, I mean, just go to github.com slash Equinor and then search for WebViz, and all these things will come up. Okay. But one of them has a bunch of demos um, that you can go explore here we go so webviz subsurface has this live demo application and it pulls up this little uh, web app which is hosted on azure that i think you could basically implement your own version of with uh, the code they've given you and then right. uh, what was i looking at the other day the segway viewer for example um yeah and i think all this so, stuff is built with dash yeah and the great thing about having access to the repos is that you can get the components that are in these dash apps if you just want a seismic computer you can pull it out of what they're doing and you know adapt it to your own needs uh which is which is another great way to find out how to do stuff actually so i'm almost done with my part uh, i'll maybe skip back to why can't i bring that up because that's in the way there we go uh the dash gallery uh, I found very mm. useful when learning this because you can, there's kind of a selection of different applications in here that have, um, you know, all kinds of different functionality. And I, you just kind of look, you know, have in mind the thing that you're looking for. It's like, I want uh, to be able to process an image, uh, you know, upload an image to Dash and do some stuff with it. And so there's an app here that um, is an image processing app that lets you apply. Um, uh, uh, filters from Python image library, I think, to this, so blurring and so on. Uh, and so it, you can upload apps. And Matt, I was looking into this when we were talking about, you know, ways to do the fossil net kind of concept. Hmm, right. um, there's energy related things in here as well. The Dash folks have probably looked at that. There's a simple well plot that's just based on, you know, Plotly's plot. Uh, this New York oil and gas. Uh, dashboards kind of interesting. So this has production data uh, from a lot of wells in New York State, and so you know you can mouse over uh, the wells to see production curves changing and you know, different kinds of functionality all tied together. So date range you want to look at, and so on. So you know if you want uh, a map explorer, here's a component you can grab out and plot well lat and longs on this, and you know. This would be a cool app for if you have a large database of wells that you could mouse over these and then pull up um, the well log visualizer from the hackathon this weekend would be would be really interesting to see. So a few challenges there, folks. Good. Well, uh, that is that's all from my part on on kind of going from Jupyter to uh, to Dash applications through a few different modes. All right. So, should we uh, should we take a short break and we can sw switch over and I can make sure I know how to get my face to show up while I'm talking in Zoom because um, I'm sure there's a way, but it's going to take me a minute. Um, how does that sound to you, Brendan? Sounds great. Okay, so it's fifteen past. Uh, how long do you want to take? 
Yeah, should we take yeah. uh, take a 10 minute break? And then that's probably the only one we need to do. Sound good? Sounds good. Let's meet back here at 25 past the hour and um, we'll see you, see you then everyone. All right.
All right, we are back in business. Um, so, what we're going to do now is have a look at um, building a small web application. We're going to do it basically from the ground up. Okay, so um, maybe we can have a look quickly at the repo actually. Um, should we do that? So, just as a reminder, it's swu.ng slash t20-fry slash mvp. Um, and I'm sorry, it's, I've got it all, it's rather small here, but we will make do. Um, and let me just explain kind of what's in here. Okay, let's do that, it's a bit easier to read. So there's an app. Um, this is the app that we're going to develop. Right now uh, it does not have a lot in it. Um, it's just got a couple of files. Um, uh, there's the dash stuff, there's um, some notebooks, and then the, both the notebooks and the app folders have a kind of master version. So the master versions of the notebooks are all filled in. Um, the ones that are sort of uh, relevant, I guess, because not all of them, it didn't make sense necessarily to do all of them that way, um, as you'll see. Uh, and then in the app master, um, the app there is complete. So that's basically the thing that we're gonna, that's the thing we're gonna build, okay? So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's the, the completed thing. So if you if you don't like typing, you can have a look at that and just kind of look at the code and run it and so on. Um, but if you want to type along, then go into the app uh, directory. So anyway, we'll we'll come back to all of that. I'll I'll reiterate. Yes, Brendan. Matt, I think our video isn't showing. No, that's right. It's not. Um, okay, good. I will. It will. It's it will return. Plan. Don't worry. Um, it's part of the plan. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure you can see sort of uh, what what I'm typing for now. Um, so here I am, I'm in the repo that I've, I've downloaded, okay? So there are my um, there are my files. I'm gonna just start Jupyter Notebook uh, right from here, actually. Um, well, yeah, it's fine. And let's see, hopefully that opens in on this screen, and indeed it has, okay, good. So I think I think what we'll do maybe let's first perhaps I will start with this actually I don't want that to maximize stop it stop trying to help me Ubuntu um, oh, okay fine <laughs> computers let me help you with that uh, okay so um, here I am in that same folder but in uh, Jupyter Notebook, and I'm going to go into the notebooks, and I'm going to look at hitting some web APIs. And what what I wanted to do here was basically just think a little bit, just to sort of frame some of um, what I'm going to do, basically, um, uh, so that it maybe makes a little bit more sense when, when we actually do it. If you're sort of wondering, like, why are we doing that? Or why would? How could I use that later? Um, I just want to sort of frame some of that um, conversation. So I just want to have a look at some existing things on the internet, um, but in a way that you might not have um, looked at things on the internet before, I guess, um, because we're going to do it from within Python. Um, and um, see what we can do with the data that we get back. Okay, so um, let's go and have a look at um, first of all just importing a library that we're gonna need um, called requests and um, then we're gonna make a request with requests and it's gonna go off and read stuff off the internet um, I typically call the response to the request R um, and we're gonna use this get uh, function and what get wants is a URL. So um, let's go look for um, what should we look for? for di uh, the dinosaur page um, on Wikipedia. 
since we're going to make a fossil classifier, we better know what dinosaurs are. So, so here's like Wikipedia. I can read this page, obviously, as a human. And Wikipedia is sort of su substantially aimed at humans uh, reading, um, reading articles. Um, but we can, oh, I guess I'm already in. Mostly humans. Mostly humans, yeah. Uh, we can also read that page with requests. So let's do that. Um, now, it's uh, come back. Uh, let's find out what it did. Um, we get this uh, property on the response called uh, status code. Whoops. Um, and that's a 200. So this is from that family of codes. The one you will certainly have heard of is a 404, uh, which means that the thing you're looking for doesn't exist. Um, there are others like uh, uh, 500, for example, where the uh, server has broken and you'll get very familiar with those as, as you get into web development. Um, 300s mean that the thing you're looking for has moved somewhere else. Um, but 200 means that everything was awesome. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, well, we can have a look at r.content first. That's what it got back, um, literally uh, as bytes. Now, in this case, it looks like a string um, because these are uh, encoded as text. And uh, because of that, we can also look at r.text, which is a string rather than a byte string. Um, but as you can see, it's, um, you know, as you'd expect in Python, it's full of the sort of new lines and so on. But if you can read between the new lines, there's uh, what look, look, looks like HTML, if you're familiar with that. And indeed, this is exactly what we would see if we went to this dinosaurs page and uh, went to view page source and uh, yeah. inspected that. And you may have some kind of uh, plugin, I think I probably do, to sort of um, organize that code a little bit. Um, well, it's debatable whether you can call HTML code, but you know, th so this is coloring mine in. Yours might look a bit different, um, but this is exactly what we're seeing uh, when we go use um, requests to get this page. Now, it right. turns, go ahead. That's what web browsers do basically, right? Is they turn that wall of, of things into something that looks pretty. Yeah, exactly. Um, in fact, your browser is making uh, what's called a get request. Um, so there are there are a few different verbs, I guess, in the HTTP protocol. Um, the two that we're going to look at today are get and post. Um, but when you ask for a web page, your browser makes a get request. Um, now we can use the uh, IPython knows how to display sorry uh, lots of things, um, including HTML. So we can use, um, oh, sorry, I think it's got capital IP like that. Um, we can use the IPython display module to uh, render things like HTML for us so that we can actually let <laughs> Jupyter and IPython have a go. Just like um, Brendan was earlier, he was showing a Plotly Dash application inside a little iframe like this. Uh, now we're looking at that Wikipedia page. And actually, if you want uh, another really cool thing you can do with Wikipedia, um, in uh, Thomas Martin's tutorial back on Monday, uh, he showed how you could go get a Wikipedia table, turn it into CSV, and get it straight into pandas. So what we're sort of getting at here is this idea that resources on the internet, um, while they're uh, ostensibly for humans, can be used by computers just as, just as easily, right? And actually, um, in fact, if we go look at uh, Wikipedia, it does have an API. Um, so uh, what's an API? Well, an API is an interface for, um, well, at, at least in this context, um, and often when you hear about people talking about APIs, if they're, talk if they're a web developer, they're talking about a web API probably. Um, you, you, know, you could talk about, say, Matplotlib's API, its interface, like how do you communicate with Matplotlib? Um, uh, but I'm talking about web APIs. This is how can we interact with web resources um, with a computer, basically. So machine-readable web as opposed to the sort of human-readable web. Um, so here is the English Wikipedia API documentation. Um, you can go have a look there at uh, all of the different commands we can uh, ask for. The recent changes feed 
is quite good. And I think um, it gives an example of the sort of call you can make at the bottom here. Um, so I just Googled uh, Wikipedia API to get here, by the way. Um, so Wikipedia, the media wiki software is written in uh, PHP. So they're all like uh, API.php. And then there's some kind of action. And uh, this action is feed recent changes. Um, and what we can see here is a bunch of items and each item is a recent change. I think there are 48 recent changes by default and it's got it buried in here um, who the user was, uh, the, um, sorry, it's the page that was changed uh, and then the URL for that page, um, the description of the uh, <laughs> of the change, so undid some previous revision, and then there'll be text describing um, other metadata and the change itself and so on. Um, so you can interrogate Wikipedia in that way from, you know, right from uh, Python as well. So you, if you wanted to build, say, a bot, you know, that um, grabs the recent changes from Wikipedia and then goes and makes a Plotly Dash app, you would be using this exact interface to do that. Um, with something like beautiful soup in the middle to go through and make sense of all of that XML, right? And turn it into something that you can actually, uh, some data, some structured data, uh, dictionaries and things. Because as far as I know, Wikipedia doesn't have a web API that gives you back um, more Python friendly uh, data like a JSON, mm. for example. Right. Yeah, so, you know, Going, going to the, that page I just showed you in the web browser is exactly the same as these two lines of code here. Um, okay, so uh, that's awesome, but you know, uh, I don't want to read Wikipedia, I want geological stuff. So let's go check out this MacroStrat um, website because it's, it's pretty cool. And um, basically it's aiming to be a sort of global geological database. And uh, I think it's University of Wisconsin. Uh, Madison, yeah, yeah, it's been pretty well represented this week, man. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, in yeah. fact, I think there was one day when all three presenters uh, simultaneously uh, at the had, same time were al alumni from there. Um, this yeah. uh, Shannon Peters seems to be the PI on this team, and I'd love to chat to him and meet him because this project is totally fantastic. Um, anyway, uh, let's go. Let's click on this API. That sounds promising and this API root, and here it is, um, very nicely self-documenting um, API that they have. And um, let's see, I just want to remind myself which endpoint I found was easiest to go and get something straightforward from. Um, well, why don't we, do, yeah, let's do this all from within here, actually. Um, I'll copy that API endpoint, and we'll go here and let's and, store And what's that an there. API endpoint, Matt? Just to... Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit probably about this later, but um, let's just break down a URL here for a second. Um, Uh-oh. I just tried to blow up my page, and it's not enjoying shuffling everything around. Um, oh, goodness. So the HTTPS piece, this part here that I'm highlighting is called the scheme. Um, so I'm sure you're f familiar with this, uh, even if you don't uh, know what it means. This is a secure hypertext transfer protocol, um, which is a, like a regular um, HTTP, but with the added SSL, the secure socket layer. Um, so that everything is encrypted, everything in the body of these requests is encrypted when it goes over the internet. Uh, then we've got the domain, MacroStrat, the TLD or top level domain, which is .org. Um, occasionally on a um, uh, website you'll see, or on some sort of resource, you'll see this extra bit here. Uh, this is the port. You'll become familiar with ports uh, when you start doing uh, web development of your own. Um, by default, HTTPS goes over port 443, uh, HTTP goes over 80, um, so you don't need to specify those. Um, and then after that, we've got a path, and um, the path gives the, the route, if you like, to the resource. 
and uh, or route, sorry. Um, and we'll see some other components to URLs as well uh, later on. Um, okay, so this the thing at the end of the path, uh, I would call an, an end point. Oh, goodness, sorry, I'll stop changing the sizes of things. It's uh, incredibly annoying. Um, okay, so r equals requests dot get on the URL. Because Linux is good at some things, but not at others. And then uh, let's just, <laughs> yeah. Now, you saw that thing we had before. Let's look at r.text. Um, so check that out. That is basically a text blob full of, you know, new lines and stuff. But um, I recognize this as JSON. So this is uh, JavaScript object notation. And this is the lingua franca of the web, basically. So um, Python, many like requests anyway, already knows how to deal with JSON. And it basically translates directly into a Python dictionary. So um, we can use this JSON method on the, rec the response object um, to just get a Python dict straight back. So um, maybe I'll call that J. Um, and then we can go and look at uh, now is what's the structure of this thing? Yeah, so then, then, then of course, you can just key into that uh, dictionary. I think that's all of it, yeah. Um, to see like various bits of it and get pieces out. But we don't, we don't really have anything to get out yet because um, there wasn't any particularly great information in there. Uh, what I really want to look at is the, uh, the other endpoints available. And it turns out that um, there's one called units. So we can add units onto the end here. And um, I think if we ask for that, On that URL. Oh, sorry. And then uh, r.json. Okay, so this tells us what the options are. So we've got options, and then I've got things like section ID, lith, lith type. I can ask for all sorts of stuff. But the thing I'm interested in is this lat long. So I can I can actually give this a lat long. Now, how do I do that? Uh, well, I'm going to need a params, a set of parameters. So I'm going to make a params dictionary. And I'm going to use uh, my lat long, which is about this uh, minus 64. Uh, minus 64 like that. Um, and then I can pass those params uh, as uh, actually, so I don't think I think you can use it as positional argument, but it's called params. And um, OK, check it out. I got back a result. And this time, because I passed some data to the server, it's given me a different kind of response. And this time, I've actually got data. So you can see I've got things um, that seem to have unit IDs. Uh, this one's got no name. But if I scroll down a bit, this will start to make more sense. OK, look, here's the North Mountain Basalt. Top age, bottom age. Um, whether there's an outcrop or not, and other information like that. Uh, group name, formation name, uh, min and maximum thickness, um, all this sort of stuff. So this is interrogated directly from the Macrostrat um, database, which is built on basically a global 3D geological model. Um, so it's it's pretty awesome. You can basically get a vertical stratigraphic profile from for, for anywhere on the planet. And it's completely like vectorized. Uh, it's three dimensional. So you can get this section wherever you like. And then you can further interrogate those units to find out more about those ages and so on. Um, it's extremely uh, interesting. So um, yeah, and uh, as you can see, pretty easy to interrogate with, you know, a handful of lines of code here. Now, before we move on from that, let's just have a look at this um, R object, this response object. It turns out that it um, also knows what the URL was that it actually went for when we made that request. And it, because of the way that I made that request with a get uh, function, it's made a get request. And with a get request, the parameters of the request, the, the options or uh, the arguments, if you like, are passed in the URL. Right, so there you can see the, uh, the, op the the that dictionary I made has been stuck onto the end of the URL. And if I took that URL, 
I could put it in a browser, which also makes a GET request, and get exactly the same information back. This is one of the nice things about GET requests is that the, all the data is in the URL. So you can share the result of a query with somebody else just by giving them the URL. You don't have to tell them any other information. It's all packed in there. But as we'll see yeah, later... Yeah, can reproduce the request they, Exactly. Way. Yeah, yeah. It's really nice, right? You can go give them the same resource just for, by giving them a string. Yeah. Um, so, hey, Matt, real quick. Uh, MacroStrat's pretty cool. Uh, that's, an, that's a pretty slick uh, API. Yeah. Brainstorm a hackathon project that you think would be interesting using that API. Like, what's something cool you could do with it? Yeah, so I mean, basically, it knows the stratigraphy for anywhere on the planet. Um, I saw a really nice observable that I'll put, and maybe Justin knows it. Um, but actually, and the person who made it is in uh, Software Underground uh, too, but uh, the makes a stratigraphic column in JavaScript for every for any given location. Um, right. so, so that's pretty cool. Now, we did some things in the geothermal hackathon recently where we were ex using um, a language, an NLP API um, like this one, which I'll just go through really quickly, um, to, to send a piece of text. So I got this text out of a news report on mining. Um, you won't be able to run this because you need a Meaning Cloud account, which only takes a minute to go make, but um, you'll have to have your own password. Uh, and then you can make, you know, it's a few more lines of code. Um, but basically, I'm just going to send that text to um, this URL. And um, we're doing it in a slightly different way. It's not a GET request, as you can see here. Um, it, well, I'm using a slightly different way of, of uh, making the query, uh, but we're actually making a post request this time. So um, this uh, is going to send the data in a, a JSON string instead of uh, in the URL. So we're sending what's called a payload um, of information. And this turns out to be really, I guess, got a couple of advantages. Basically, we can send as much data as we want. So we can send a, you know, a bunch of images, for example, which you couldn't do in a URL. So you couldn't make a GET request with data like that. And plus, the URL, of course, is not encrypted. The URL is going to get stored on server logs and stuff like that. It basically travels in the clear. So if you want to send data uh, encrypted, you're going to need to send it with a different verb. So um, a post request is sort of the easiest uh, one. So um, we'll often find that we want to send post requests to servers, even when we're not actually getting the server to store anything or remember anything or sort of post data. Um, it just turns out to be a more convenient way to pass data around. So yeah, I got it to uh, analyze that text and uh, it sent back um, an analysis. Here are the keys of that analysis. Things like quantity expression lists, money expression list. What's that? Well, it found in that text these financial uh, data. Um, it found a quotation from a person um, quoted in the article saying that you know the production numbers were down in May. And in the entity list, we'll find that it found all sorts of things, including things like Yukon, which it knows is a geopolitical entity. And it knows that it's in the Americas, uh, in Canada. So, um, you know, this, like, this was free, right? The service exists on the internet. I can pass text to it in a few lines of code and get back an analysis that would have taken me, you know, I mean, I'd have had to install um, NLTK and downloaded all sorts of right. uh, dictionaries and things so that I could prepare my text properly. It would have taken me an hour, but these sorts of web APIs can um, save us a bunch of time. So it's extracted these locations out of there. So now I could hook that up with the MacroStrat and automatically go and get the stratigraphy for any place mentioned in a news article on a mining website. So yeah, I love that kind of, I mean, this is very 2000 and eight kind of uh, view of you know microservices and the original kind of hackathons were really all about this sort of tying microservices together you know like the bus timetable with the crime statistics from the city and stuff like that um but i right i still actually believe in that web like i i actually think that there's lots of exciting things could happen in our community or inside an organization like a university or a company building a lot of little microservices that can talk to each other and do interesting things. Because basically making these calls, it's a bit like calling someone else's function, right? 
It's just that it can also have a database behind it. And it can also be doing like, you know, delivering the results of some giant machine learning thing that you can change whenever because you own the server. So um, you don't have to wait for the user to update their software so that you can they can use your awesome new function. I can just change my web service to bring them that new stuff tomorrow. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice model, I think, of delivering software to people. Um, okay. Very interesting. I'll just, you know, I'll say because I'm involved with it that uh, uh, this OSDU effort actually is using uh, web REST APIs to uh, um, search for, query, uh, and deliver data uh, from its databases. So, okay. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. So, uh, one thing you'll. Implementations are using it too. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, lots of things are actually implemented like this, sort of under the hood. So often you'll find in a right. modern web application that there is a REST API on the back end, and then the front end is, you know, just a bunch of uh, JavaScript that's query using yeah. the back the back end um, for data and so on. Um, you often hear talk people talk about REST. You'll see REST in front of API a lot. Um, it's a bit like one of those sequence trigger things I was sort of alluding to earlier. I feel like there's there's probably academic agreement on what constitutes a RESTful API, but developers seem to argue about it all day long, and I'm not interested in those arguments. Um, I'm just trying to make practical things, so I feel like just do your do your thing and worry about REST later, or let software engineers worry about REST. Um, I'm not going to run this last bit. You can go check it out in the completed notebook because um, I need to move on. Um, but it basically, it's hitting another API a bit like the one that we're going to make. So let's go make, or let's, so we, we wanted to make that app, right? The app that can detect fossils. First of all, we need to make sure that we can make a, a model that can, <laughs> that can do that, right? So the, the proof of concept here <laughs> is going to be a trained model that can recognize fossils occasionally, at least. Um, so let's have a go at that. So I'm in the fossil classifier minimal um, project now. And this actually goes and downloads that data set again. If you've already got it because you were running Brendan's stuff, you won't need to do this again. Um, we just moved it, like I say, to S3. So the idea is that this can be- Maybe, a, I, I kind uh, of cheated and had the local file that I okay. just ran. Um, it's taking, it as well. it takes a minute. It's probably, I can't remember, but 100, 150 megs or something. Um, they're all PNGs because we didn't want any um, JPEG artifacts in there. Um, and, you know, we can use that same trick we used earlier with HTML to go read the markdown um, notice about copyright and so on. Okay, so um, now here's the same data you had before. Um, I have got this, now we're actually going to reuse some of these uh, bits because, of course, when we get data later from the phone app, we're going to have to do the same things to it that we do, that we've trained on, right? So um, we're going to simplify this problem by making, uh, mode L means it's a lightness image, so it's grayscale, and we're going to resize to 32 by 32. Um, and then because we're staying in scikit-learn land here. Um, we can only have a 2D X. So the, the, machine, the, the machine's gonna learn on a matrix um, where each row is one record in the data set. So uh, Ravel just means take the image and flatten it into a vector. And then um, I'm dividing by 255 because that's how Pill, like Pillow reads these things. Um, and we're just gonna turn them into zero to one instead of zero to two five five. Um, anything else about that? Like basically, and I've put it in a function because I know that later I'm gonna need that function to process the images that we get from the phone app in exactly the same way. So right. we'll functionalize it now um, so we can reuse it later. Yeah. And you might not have realized that at first, might you? Right, Matt, you might have come back to that. You might have found yourself repeating this or something and been like, hey, I need to go up there and write a function. I 100% did not do that at first. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I definitely had that code baked into this gnarly loop here um, and came out later and pulled it out and then tried to convince you that I was smart enough to think ahead, <laughs> right. which, which, I, which I wasn't. I didn't mean to call you out there. But. It's fine. I feel, I feel seen. It's no, it's fine. what I do as well. Um, 
So yeah, we, I'm mean, only going to use the Train and Val set, and I'm only going to use these four uh, fossils, because if you throw them all in, the, the classifier does really badly. <laughs> so, and because I wanted to cut this down, I cheated again. This is all cheating. By the way, when you're in a hackathon, or in an MVP situation, it's all cheating. Like, the... I mean, the Pebble Watch, you remember the Pebble Watch? was I think it was one of the first Kickstarter things that like really blew up. I mean, their MVP was a video. Like, this thing did not exist. And they raised, I think, 10 million bucks or something. Like, almost <laughs> in a week. And right. I, I, didn't it crush them in the end because they just couldn't deliver? They couldn't get into Yeah, production? I don't think it was a resounding success on the other side of all that. But, yeah, yeah. You know, as well, it depends watch, what your goal was. <laughs> Yeah. Was your goal to build the watch? Maybe not. <laughs> um, but it just goes to show but that I mean, the, the, the level yeah, some of... Some have been like... A web page or a, a, a PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Where you yeah. just go through and fake every click in the web page in your PowerPoint to make it look like, oh, and then the right. person clicks here and then they get this, a picture of a cat. And um, it's actually all you need to convince people of an awesome idea. It's kind of awesome right it's beautiful so yeah, I think it, yeah yeah Airbnb was uh, was the founders renting out their living room during a big conference in San Francisco or something like that okay yeah to, and, a, and a web page around it and then other people renting out their living rooms to conference attendees and to see if it would grow and get traction and totally and I think yeah. uber was um, like a taxi club for uh, or a lift sort of sharing thing for founders in the, in San Francisco. You know, these things all started yeah. very small. So that's how that's what we're doing. Um, so looping over the sets, looping over the classes, and then looping over all the files in those folders. Um, and uh, oh, and I've, I've also added a flipped version of the images to try and do a little bit better. Ah, right? A little bit of augmentation. A little bit of augmentation. Um, and that means I've had to add the, um, the label uh, twice. Uh, so that's what that business there is. And then we, we end up with X train, X val, Y train, Y val. So we've got something to train on and something to validate against. Um, that didn't work because it didn't run something, probably, maybe. Oh, no, because I haven't changed the path. So, yeah, I, I was chatting about this earlier in the um, Slack, but we made a bit of a last-minute change as we pub we were sort of simultaneously publishing this tutorial and the FossilNet data set. Um, so you'll just need to change that path there. Yeah, don't simultaneously launch your MVP and make changes to it when you're yeah and that. and learn how to use OBS studio at the same time <laughs> all at once okay so uh, we seem to have some data there's a, um, a fish apparently okay so let's let's make a model um, random forest was the first thing I tried I promise it actually was um, and what am I doing just setting the random state if you're in our repo you're gonna um, if, if if you inflated it from our environment file, you've got scikit-learn, uh, I think, 0.23.1. I had to downgrade it because the th platform that I'm going to show you how to deploy to later is on that version. So I didn't want to fiddle about with... You can install your own stuff on uh, Python anywhere. Um, it's not a problem. Like You could totally upgrade it. I just didn't want to for the purposes of it. I thought it would be easier to just downgrade my... <laughs> But of course, then it had all these consequences for Mateo and others, so I'm sorry about that. Um, max step five and min samples per leaf um, are basically just some very basic steps to try to stop this thing from overtraining too much. Because if you let it build very deep trees um, in the random forest, and if you let it put one sample on each leaf, it's just going to remember the data, basically. So um, uh, you'll get essentially a perfect training score. So I forgot this data set's a bit bigger now, so it takes a little minute. Um, okay, so there's my training score, 0.74, and my validation score is 0.61. So um, it's definitely a little bit overtrained, but you know, this is my this is my uh, proof of concept. Um, there's my confusion matrix. 
if you if I was using a newer version of scikit-learn, I would have plot confuse matrix, and this would look a bit nicer. But uh, here's, you know, we can just see for ourselves that it's not, uh, you know, a, just a nice diagonal set of supports that it's making quite a lot of errors, um, which we know because we can see that the score is not particularly great. Um, so yeah, it turns out it's okay at four rams. Uh, this is the four ram line. Um, it's not particularly great at the others. Um, but as far as my proof of concept goes, I'm, to be honest, I'm satisfied. Like at that point, you can start building your app and maybe someone else on your hackathon team or whatever can go off and try and make an awesome model and we can plug them in later. Right. But now is not the time to fiddle with the model kind of thing. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna go back and put all the data together um, so that I can train the best possible model. Um, so let's just do that because of course, you know, we want the best result. Are you going to try and go for Steve's uh, record here? He, well, I, I mean, I didn't load my test data, so I'll never find out really what this model does. Um, this this model does what it does kind of thing. And then I'm just dumping out the uh, random forest because um, later on we're going to need that in the app, right? Because the app's not going to do any right. training. It's just going to eat the model file, this um, joblib dump. And all we have to do is inference. So all we have to do is dot predict on this um, instantiated right. model later. Yeah. All right. So. Um, no, that's good, Matt. I mean, yeah. I start with random forest for everything, even as a placeholder for something I want to do later, often just to get something working. Yeah, on um, classification, I mean, it just does well. <laughs> right. It's just as um, robust to like not very much data and um and it's simple right and 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 the um you know that api that fit predicts api that scikit learn you know implemented so well is used by a lot of libraries now uh, as a model too so um you know it's easy to drop in other stuff uh, that's more complicated uh, later on exactly exactly yeah so I, I basically parked the whole problem of making a good model um as, as my proof of concept is satisfied at this point okay so so i'm switching right. over now to a um uh to my text editor um to have a look at this flask app and um i'm just noticing that i had another these were open before, so I'm just going to close those so I don't get too confused. Okay, awesome. So I'm in app, and then this is app.py. And this is basically the exact thing that's off of um, the Flask website. Um, here it is. So if you go Google Flask, um, web development one drop at a time, um, this is the page you'll find, and if you scroll down a bit, you'll get to a minimal application. And there it is. Five lines of Python to instantiate a web server. And um, then we can basically just adapt this server to start doing our bidding. Um, so I've, okay, I haven't copied it exactly, sorry, that was a bit of a fib. Um, I, I've adapted it slightly, but it's, it's, it's the same code. So this, we're gonna, let's try running this, right? This is this is our kind of, uh, um, what would you call it? Just our, our prototyping workflow where everything needs to keep working. Um, uh, you know, one of the things we notice in the classroom is that um, beginners often want to just start typing. You know, you'd be like, okay, let's make a function to pass this text and make a dictionary and Quite, quite often a beginner will sort of get five lines of code down and then try running their, you know, their function. And of course it doesn't work. And to fix the problem and then there's a different problem. You fix that problem and now there's a different problem. Um, if you can just keep make sure, making sure that everything works all the time, then debugging is much, much easier. So, yeah. Matt, that's actually a good point. And I wanted to make it earlier, but that's what I'll, how, what I'll often do too, is start from a working example, right? That's close to the same functionality and just change one thing at a time. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's to what we make all do, it slowly it? into your problem, right? And uh, um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. One hundred percent. Okay, so I'm, I've just opened another terminal. I'm going to go into the app folder now, and um, there's the uh, minimal app. And there's a note in there saying that by default, well, I'll show you if I run this. I'm so sorry, I'm not looking at Slack at all. Um, I'm, I'm. Uh, you're on it. Paying attention to it. So yeah. Thanks. Um, it says in, in red words, this is a development server, don't use it for, in a production deployment, use a production uh, server instead. And um, we're also running this in, we're trying to run it, we're saying that it's a production environment. So it's hence the red warning. So it turns out to be much more convenient actually to run it in a development context. Um, now there's some code in the file to set this in different environments. So you'll need to type this if you're on Windows. Um, for me, it's this. Why don't I just copy it since I'm here? And um, sorry, I know it's really confusing being able to see two. So now I've set that environment variable. And uh, if I do flask run again, um, now we're in a development environment. It doesn't have the red warning. And it says the debugger is active and um, it's doing this restarting. We'll see what that means in a minute, but it turns out to be really convenient. So um, yeah, it says it's running here. So let's copy that and go to a browser and paste that address in. And very small, I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> there is, um, there's our application, it's, it's running. And um, now all we have to do is not break it, right? Simple. That's all we have to do is not break it and add reading in a model and uh, get it to do all the other things we'd like it to do. Um, awesome. Now I just I am going to have to. My memory is not terribly good, so I'm going to have to remind myself what I wanted to do first. Um, maybe we'll like. Clearly, we're going to need to pass data to the app. So why don't we look at a couple of ways of um, of doing that? We already saw a query parameter, right? The query string. Um, so it turns out that um, if I um, from Flask also import the uh, request, and uh, we can then get at that request, um, it's a dictionary basically. We can treat it like a dictionary, and uh, I'm just going to make the assumption that I'm going to get get something. So I'm going to actually ask. For, well, I'll tell you what. No, let's ask for a name. Request dot get. Um, whoops. Name, and um, then I'm going to. Now I'd normally use f strings here, but. Oh, actually, yeah, no, sorry, we, we, we will be able to use a version of Python that has F strings later. I'm just thinking about deployment here, we will be able to use Python 3.7 or, or 3.6. So um, let's use F strings. Okay, so um, I'm reaching into a thing called request. And I'm getting the thing that's keyed with name, and then I'm using that name. Um, in the return statement. Um, so hopefully that you, you know that makes some intuitive sense. Um, now if I go back to my terminal, we'll see that uh, it has when I saved the file. I didn't tell you I was doing that, but I saved the file and it actually restarted. There's the get request it made before, um, and uh, it's saying oh I gave a 404 to the favicon, which is the little symbol that goes in the tab in your browser. Um, because I haven't got a favicon in this um, repo, uh, so it got a 404 on that, and it made the browser makes that automatically. Um, is there a swan fa a favicon out there? Uh, there is, yeah, yeah. It's on our website, so yeah, we can. I could share that ICO file if people want to use it. That'd be a good uh, tutorial or post or something like that, just to say, hey, yeah, you could swangify all your apps. Just uh, just use this. So I don't know if you remember how to make or uh, pass these uh, query parameters, but we do it with a question mark after the, um, in this case, the port. Uh, and 
then uh, something equals something else. So I can say, uh, why don't I say mat, and I get an attribute error. Oh, I know what I've done. I've not. I've missed out a word. I, f I felt like I wanted to type another dot. And that's why, because there's request.args, I'm pretty sure it is, yes. Uh, so let's save that this time. So this is a nice thing about the, the debugger mode, is that when you make a mistake, now I've got it blown up in this horrible way, um, but when you make a mistake, you get the trace back directly here. So you don't have to like put in a lot of print statements and go and see what the server says, you know, what you've got in your console, um, or if you're operating on a you know, on another platform, you don't have to go and like read the server logs. Um, it just comes back straight at you because you wouldn't want this on a website. That would be a horrible thing to show to your users uh, and also a super dangerous thing <laughs> to show to your users because you're showing them uh, your code. Um, so uh, anyway, I've saved that now. I can see the web server starting again in the background. There it goes. And um, maybe I could see, if I arrange things like this, we're not going to be able to see faces. And then Victoria is going to get mad at me again. Um, sorry, Victoria, I'm not picking on you. Um, but at least if I put it down there, I can we can see it when I save stuff. OK, if I go rerun this, um, hooray. Uh, I won't blow it up again. That was annoying. But uh, now I've got Hello Matt there. I bet that if I don't give it anything, OK, Hello None, that's not not great, is it? Um, yeah, but uh, I guess it's not graceless. <laughs> it, didn't cr it didn't crash my server. Um, now, I will maybe mention... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Matt, they've just gone, they've gone full fish pun on, uh, on Slack. Oh, no. Um, you, you are allowed yeah. to do this as well. Um, and what the, well let's have a look at what this does this is essentially another way of passing a a thing into your server whoops but now i have to put it in the path uh, and i got a type error because why oh all right because uh when you do this you're going to have to pass um the parameter of course I, I, i'm getting a name error right on this because it gets into the function and it doesn't know what that is so i have to pass it into the function um now I can reload this page and, oh, sorry. Of course, the whole point is that I can now pass the parameter in the path. Um, so you'll sometimes see websites do this on an API where you've, you've got like resources, like a user, say, or if in a library API, you might have like book. So you would go to like mylibrary.com slash book, query ID equals something or title equals this and it's sending you to the right table in the database, basically. Um, I tend not to use this all that much. I tend to go define endpoints instead and use query strings. OK, well, in the um, completed App Master app, there's a, I did do another example in there of another endpoint. Uh, I make an endpoint for um, a bit of geophysics. It's called uh, slash impedance, where you can pass in a couple of query parameters, uh, VP and row B, and then you can um, get it to send you back the impedance. So that's what a little sort of calculator API would look like. Um, but I'm not going to go into that now because um, I'm going to move on. Uh, we're going to look instead at making a predict endpoint for our um, Maybe I'll leave that there. Let's make it. Let's let's see what it looks like to make another um, another endpoint or another page, um, if you like. So we're going to need. So you'll notice that what all we're doing is writing a function which um, returns a string so far, and um, the function has a decorator which gives the route or route to um, the endpoint that we want to serve on. So I'm going to write predict here. Um, so we're going to go to our website slash predict. And I'm going to get rid of that because we don't need that anymore. And um, let's call this one <laughs> just to keep. Actually, it's not going to be one. It's going to be three is the corresponding sort of component, I guess, of the um, completed app. And I don't know, what should we write here? We're going to, let's, we know we're going to send back a prediction or something like that. And um, now we're going to need this way to send an image in. Well, 
that's a bit of a problem, right? Because how are we going to send an image in? We can't do that um, easily in a URL, so with the get method that we've seen. But what we could do for now as a cheaty thing is just use the URL of an image, right? If we find an image on the internet, we can give a URL to our app. Um, so let's do that. URL uh, equals re request.args.get and we'll call it URL when we pass it in. And for now, I guess we can just make the assumption that we're going to um, get one. Now, I've given you this utils thing here. Let me just walk you a little bit through that. Um, don't worry too much. Oh, I haven't put much in there. Well, I don't want to write all of that. I think I was going to move it over from another um, thing, but you know what? Let's just, I'm going to open the um, app master utils and I'm just going to get stuff from there. Okay, so I'll, I'll bring them over and then I'll, I'll just explain what they are, but they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know what, I'm actually not even sure. I think I might need to update some of this repo. Anyway, so I'm using the one from AppMaster now. Um, now, we've got the image to array that I already showed you because that was in the uh, notebook. And then we've got this thing called fetch image. Um, so I think there's a section in the notebook we were in that explains sort of where this comes from. But you've basically already seen this code, right? It's requests.get of a URL. That's going to give me an image. And then I'm giving that to a thing called a bytes.io which you can think of as being like a open file handle. It's, a basic, it's basically like a file. Um, and I'm, remember when we looked at r.content, like r.text was a string, but r.content was a byte string, and that's just a, a, um, a bunch of bytes. So the bunch of bytes that we get from the URL, uh, which in this case is going to represent an image, is just going to get turned into a file-like object called a bytes.io. Um, and then, because it's a file-like object, I can give that to, uh, in this case, I'm using pillow or pill um, image object, and it can open it just like an ordinary file. So it's kind of neat because I never had to save this file. It's just in memory. Um, you know, maybe you'd want to save it as a temp file or something if this was a real website, um, but I'm just going to keep it in memory, throw it straight into um, and return this pillow image object. Okay, so that's going to download this this thing that we get given, and then we just need something to make a prediction given a pill image, right? So this thing takes a classifier and a pill image. Um, we'll instantiate the classifier over in the other um, in the other file. So it does the image to array to normalize it essentially to the same type of thirty two by thirty two grayscale image that we were using in training. Um, it turns that into an X, uh, so a two, it has to be a 2D array for scikit-learn, and um, makes a prediction using the cliff. And I'm using predict proper here. Um, I mean, we could do something, you know, uh, more or less fancy, I guess. Um, maybe I should have started with like, just give me the class, just give me the prediction, and we'll return that. Um, but uh, I've gone full Monty because uh, I didn't want to do all that typing. And, um, and then we'll just return that dictionary containing the, containing the prediction. OK, so now back over here in the app, I'm going to need to uh, import utils for sure. And um, I'm probably going to need to do some other things. Let me see what I'm forgetting. Um, but right here, we can do our business, right? We can do the image equals, um, what do I call that function? Fetch image of the URL. Um, oops, utils.fetch image of the URL that we got. And um, that's giving me back, wait, did I do the I'm just doing image.open. So then I need to do image, image to array. Um, oh, no, no, no. I use that in the other function. Beg your pardon. So I just need to do this. So 
I'm just going to copy that call signature. Um, now, there's going to be something we're going to have to fix there. I'm just parking in my mind. Oh, actually, that's going to give me back a dictionary. I can't just pass that back. Um, and I need to import requests because we're using that. Um, yeah, because we're getting the URL in here. OK, so it turns out um, Flask has a thing called JSONify, um, which takes things like dictionaries uh, and turns them into uh, JSON. So I'm going to use Flask's JSONify to JSONify the thing that I got back from my own function. Um, all right, now there's still one thing missing, uh, and that's this cliff. Right, I haven't got a classifier yet. I'm going to make that a global, so I'll call it big cliff. And let's um, do the loady thing. So, what's it? Job lib dot load. And it's right next to me, I think. Let me just check the location. Yeah, so that rf dot gzip um, was the thing that I saved, I hope. Uh, so, rf dot gzip. And I mean, if I instantiate that in here, it will be instantiated when the app runs, and then it'll just stay in memory, right? So if I if if right. I do it in utils, I, I'm not sure, but I think it'll get instantiated every time I run the thing. Um, so I don't want to do that. I just want to sort of keep it as a global, like in the main application. Um, all right, have I forgotten anything here? I don't think so. I mean, I probably How does have. How does it respond to multiple requests coming in at the same time? Uh, does yeah. it spawn? This one won't like it. I'm pretty sure it only has one thread, one worker. But when we deploy okay. it on, say, Python Anywhere, it will take the responsibility for having the threads. And so it's it'll deal okay. with it. Okay, it handles that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And you can choose with so a yeah, slider how many workers there are. Okay, yeah. Oh. I sit my and it's free. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, there's a free tier, but it's not very good. Um, but right. it's quite inexpensive. I'm running several apps on there, and it's twenty bucks a month kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I say inexpensive. I realise that's still a decent amount of money. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try this and find out what I've broken. With you know, we'll find out what kind of day this is right now, I guess. Okay, um, so I guess I was expecting an error because we hadn't really done anything to handle um, ah, existing endpoint function. So the problem is that I've clobbered the root function I had before. I tend to try and name the functions the same as the endpoints, and I just forgot to change that. I should have noticed that def was underlined in red. So I'm thinking now I'm going to get a different error. Um, and this this time it's probably going to be because ah oh, I haven't imported job lib. But it's kind of yeah, kind of embarrassing. But this is basically how I work. Where you like, does it work yet? No. Okay, I'll keep trying. I'll fix that one thing. Keep banging on things. Doesn't I keep I'll yet. keep banging on things. Um, No module name job lib. Hmm. Oh goodness, sorry. Wrong app. Import job lib. This is how the sausage is made, folks. Yeah, it's exactly how the sausage is made, but I'm not understanding that uh, no app exception importing app. Hmm. I wonder what, uh, uh, maybe I'm just in a bad, yeah, I'm in my base. Uh, so let's uh, conda activate. Um, I think I've got one called T20 Fry MVP. That's a rookie error. And we're going to do Flask. Um, yeah, Flask run. I think my environment will still be set up. Oops. I started deleting things. I don't know where I am now. Okay, so flask run. And let's go back over here. No such file. And that's probably just a misspelling. 
guessing. RFW I can assure Z. you that that the Slack channel is is uh, is active uh, and it's a good, vibrant discussion. Good, lovely. So, well, I'm glad they're yeah. giving themselves something to do while I mess around with this nonsense. Um, okay, didn't send any data. That's why. <laughs> That's kind of what I was expecting because I haven't got any kind of failover, right, for not having um, a URL. Uh, so um, let's go give it a URL this time. And now I'm going to need a picture. So what should we try? We've only got trilobites, dinosaurs. <laughs> I could cheat by using trilobites because I know it likes. <laughs> it really likes finding. Man, them. I might recommend a picture of a of a fish if you can. I get it. Um, <laughs> now, the other problem here is that I probably trained on most of these images <laughs> because I downloaded That's okay. thousands of images. Um, this one's kind of got an interesting massive border. Um, okay, I've got the URL. I just copied its URL. I'm going to go, I just need to go to another tab. Oh, wait, was that my app? Yeah. Okay, so question mark, uh, URL equals that thing. Okay, it worked. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not sure I'd call this a, um, a prototype quite yet, but this is kind of what we wanted, right? Was, um, we started off saying, okay, well, the proof of concept is we need a model that makes predictions. We did that in a notebook. And then we came over I, here and we were yeah. like, well, the, the prototype is, can we make a web app which receives an image, sort of, like we right. cheated, um, and uh, gives back a prediction? And that's sort of what's happening. Except the prediction is a dictionary, which, of course, no users ever want to see. And if you, know, if you know for sure that a user doesn't want to see this, then you know for sure you don't have an MVP yet or an MVT or an MV fish or whatever it is we're building here. Right. Um, um, but still, it feels like we've got something to uh, to work with at that point. Yeah, this is okay. You know, in a big company too, like you might be, you know, the machine learning backend API person. And, and once you get it to this point, then, you know, you can build you know, your API to a specification and then the UX people come in and take this and make it into something really pretty, for example. Right, so exactly. Oftentimes, it's all you, it's all the same person. But, um, you know, this does allow you to separate the the effort in different ways and, um, you know, work effectively as, as a team. Yeah, 100%. I mean, and that's what you want to do is, uh, even if it's a hackathon team and each thing is like, each component of the team is one person, um, you want this kind of separation of concerns. Uh, what did I forget to do there? Um, it's not called result, that's why. Prediction. Um, you want this separation of concerns so that you can all focus on your own bits. Um, the tricky part during development, of course, is that if you know, you're developing these things in parallel, then it's like you're changing the URL, or sorry, the API, and the other person's trying to build a front end on the API or build this mobile app using your API or whatever. And that's a bit of a fiddle, you know. Um, and you and I kind of experienced a similar thing today with <laughs> getting this stuff uh, set up, because we each have our own personal APIs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's what I need from you. Um, Oh yeah, right. Well, let's just close the loop a little bit. Um, yeah, here's the section of that notebook I was in before, where I just build out those things that I magically appeared in the in the utils uh, later on. Um, now, here's hitting some web APIs. Maybe I should um, let's go. I'm going into hitting our API. And I, hopefully I didn't write too much in this notebook because I don't want total spoilers. Um, OK, I've got a few URLs there, so that's kind of uh, convenient. So remember, we were doing get requests before with um, Python requests. So I can um, import requests here. I can go r equals requests.get on uh, URLs, uh, the last one, let's say. 
and um, I can look at r.json because that's what I'm expecting to get back. And I get a JSON decode error because reasons. Oh, wait, what? Uh, I didn't give it the URL. Sorry, 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 sorry. That goes in the params. I'm, uh, uh, actually, I called the URL API here. Um, okay, this should, I think, give back the text. Yeah, okay, so good. So this, so now we can add the params. Um, and, you know, we know that this is just going to make a query string, but we we can provide it as a um, dict, which is just a bit more convenient. And this is where I get to put in an actual uh, thing. Oh, and I didn't pass the uh, params date. Okay, so um, awesome. We got some JSON back from the server. So this is just all on my computer. You know, so it's not particularly impressive or, or useful. Um, but it, in a way, this is like another way, you know, people sometimes say, hey, how do I use this function um, that I wrote over here in this other notebook over here and we're like well you can copy and paste the function or you could put it in a module and import your module over there um, or you, you could write a package and install it with pip um, <laughs> and then use it anywhere or you could set up a web server and uh, then go and hit it with Python requests and um, you know interpret the JSON on the other side so, so this is a very kind of roundabout way to give the results of a function to somebody else but the cool thing is that we're now this far away from being able to give it to somebody, you know, any, anywhere in the world. Um, I can let you use my function that I wrote here in my home bay today from Houston without, you know, telling you anything except a URL. I think that's kind of, that's kind of lovely. Um, all right, so what should we try now? I think we need to get to, to I'm 100%, I'm, I'm I mean, this course is obviously a week long. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm 100% not going to have time to do everything. Um, but I think I just want to get really to... Um, uh, I'll show you templates and then we'll maybe look at the upload that I did at the beginning that nobody could see because I haven't figured out how to use um, Zoom and OBS yet. So let's do that. Let me go back here. We'll make another endpoint. Let's copy the first one because... That worked out so well last time and didn't result in any kind of flailing whatsoever. Uh, let's call this one, I'll call it a form because it's going to be a form. Actually, no, I'll be consistent and call it upload because that's the form it's going to be. I think this is really useful, Matt. And, you know, especially as the cloud becomes a development platform that uh, companies and people are building on more and more. Uh, you know, get and post requests are essential to understand. JSONs, as you said, it's the medium that data is transported in really everywhere. Right. Um, it's it's useful to see, you know, you kind of started at the basic level to show how these functions are built up, right? Like, well, I, I, yeah. Dash, for example, is doing a lot of this over top of, over top of this kinds of things happening. And so it's, exactly. it's a feel for what's happening. Yeah. And um, that's right. In fact, you can because Dash is fl in a Flask. You can use right. the rest of the Flask app that Dash creates, or you can make a Flask app and use Dash from from inside it, sort of thing. So you can mix yeah. them uh, in either direction, uh, as it were. Um, so yeah, let's start off. I think I've got. So I just imported from Flask another function called Render Template. And um, we're going to uh, we're going to render that template now. And what's a template? Well, a template is just a web page. I, like you remember writing HTML in front page in Microsoft front page back in the back in the day. Uh, well, you know you do certainly write um, HTML uh, sometimes these days, but um, you don't typically put together web pages like that. What you do is you write um, some kind of boilerplate HTML that you then place stuff in afterwards using code, using Python. So it's sort of um, one way of making a dynamic web page. So we're going to need a template. And I've actually um, got some. Again, I'm just going to cheat and go into App Master uh, templates. And I'm going to get this simple page template. So this is really almost as simple as a HTML, a comp relatively complete HTML template can be. Um, it's got all of the components. So I tried to give you something that you could actually use. So it's got a header and a footer and so on. 
although we're not really going to use a lot of that. Um, and I'm just going to take this and save it as um, and go back into app. And I'm going to make a new folder called templates, which is where Flask expects to find them. And um, I'm going to save it there. Oops, oh my goodness, what did I just do? I just pasted a script into simple, what do I call it? Simple page.html. And let's save that. And uh, let's go back over here and we can look at it and then it'll make a bit more sense, I think. Oops. Simple page.html. Now let's go and see if that was really, honestly, all it takes to, I called it upload, this endpoint. Okay. And that seems to have worked. And it actually doesn't even look too uh, awful. And that's thanks to um, a, what would we call this? A sort of an extremely lightweight style framework called, um, uh, what is it called? New CSS. So you can Google new CSS if you want to see more about this template. But the idea is that it's basically just completely stripped down to just a bit of CSS styling. If you were to take this out, uh, and then resave. You can go back and see what the sort of raw HTML looks like. Um, it doesn't look terribly different. It's just a very light amount of styling on top of uh, on top of the raw HTML. Um, now, there's all sorts of places you can go if you want nicer looking pages. Uh, the one that people tend to go for first is Twitter Bootstrap. Um, so if you go Google Bootstrap, um, you'll find tons and tons of examples and components and things to make your pages look beautiful and give you all the responsive dynamic stuff that you see all over the web. Um, it will look a bit like a lot of other websites out there, but uh, it will also be really functional. Um, and you can include Bootstrap in a very similar way to this with just a link at the top of your web pages. Um, okay, so here's my sort of hello world page. It doesn't do much. Um, let's do something more interesting. Let's go um, I'm going to open, and I'm going to pop, whoops, pop down, back down to master again, and I'm going to go for the template called form. Let's talk about this one first. Um, so I'm also going to need another one because I'm using something else here that just needs a tiny bit of explaining. Um, here's the page I had before, more or less. I've put a little bit more in it, but you'll notice that it also contains these curly brace percent things. Um, one at the top there and one right in the middle here with block body written there. Um, this is a, a, the work of a templating, or it's not the work of, but it's going to use a templating engine called Jinja2. So that's spelled J-I-N-J-A and then the number two. And what it's going to do is let me use all that boilerplate stuff in one file and then the second file, form.html, says at the top, I extend base.html. Put me in where, like put this in where block title was and put this next bit in where block body went. And then it will stitch the pages together before rendering them. So it's gonna take care of composing all those pages. And it has all sorts of other nice right. features, like I can pass Python into these pages and render them later. It's a bit like an F string where you put Python into a string. Well, now we can put Python into a web page. It's exactly the same concept. Um, yeah. So uh, now I'm going to use form.html and let's have a look what that looks like. Um, I'm still on the same upload endpoint, um, which might be a bit uh, confusing later because um, I think I didn't save them. That's the problem. So I'm just going to go save as here and save back into app templates and I'm going to do the same thing to base because of course we need that because it the form page extends base and app and templates and save that okay that should be sufficient to solve this problem see what other problem we have okay none awesome so um, we actually have this uh, field here now where's that coming from well, it's coming from the um, form.html code. Now, these are comments in HTML, these things that are in green in my um, 
uh, text editor. Um, but this bit is the form. That's all there is to it. And what's it doing? Well, um, okay, I see I've given myself a problem immediately um, <laughs> because I changed the name of my endpoint. Let's just stick to, I'm going to call it form again so that everything's all nice. Um, okay, because it, this thing's going to send its data to f the endpoint form. Like when I hit the button, it, this is going to send data there as a GET request. Um, and so I've got method equals get right here. And uh, then I'm, I've got the input field. Uh, I've called it URL and it says paste the URL, please. It says it's required and it says what the width of that field is going to be. Um, it also says that it's of type URL. If you take that out, you'll see that it, it just adds some nice uh, features. And because it's required, um, you'll see that if I press predict, um, it knows that uh, it needs that. It won't let me continue. So it, if we use these um, features of HTML5, it's going to give us some really nice usability features without us having to do too much. Um, and then I've just got a button here that's going to submit the form. So let's go grab a picture of a fish. Maybe we'll use a different fish this time. This one's got a ruler in it. Let's get the address of that. Go back here, paste it in. And predict and nothing happens why not I suspect I'm well I know that I'm not ask, I mean, I'm not sending anything back to the page am I I'm not doing any prediction in here I'm gonna need all this code um, to send back apart from the end because I'm rendering a template instead of just whoops instead of just uh, sending back a dictionary so now we've got this thing called prediction. Actually, it turns out, and I, let's see what I called it. If I look back in the form, okay, here's the stuff that renders the result. And it says, if result, then go and get the class and the probability and so on. So I better call, um, call it result here. Result equals prediction. I should probably not have mixed my nouns there, but uh, okay. Let's, let's try again then. I need to go copy that again back here. All right, I get some text back saying that it thinks that's a fish and it was a fish. Um, so that's cool. It turns out not to be too tricky to sort of have a little bit more styling. Um, if I just move, um, actually, I think you can use the control slash. Hmm, I thought I could use, here we go. There. And I'll control slash that thing to comment it. Um, we can just get a little bit more fancy with the spices and um, make another prediction. Not sure what it. Oh, right. Um, I put something in here to say, hey, if um, there's a result, let's show the source image as well um, with the URL, since we've got the URL, um, and I just didn't add it. So what we can do is say. Um, prediction URL and I'll just add another item to this dictionary is the URL and then we should be able to go and we're now we're passing the thing we were given back to the user um, uh, afterwards so they can see what it was that they made the prediction on all right so there's a, I know there's a bit of a mental leap there with like you know we've like given it a URL our app has gone to the internet got that URL, turned it into a pill image, turned that into a NumPy array, made a prediction on it, made a dictionary. We've given the dictionary back to a template, which is basically just a bunch of HTML text, and let Flask take care of you know whatever has to happen for it to like render that and bring it back over here uh, with Ginger. And, uh, and here we are, come full circle. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Honestly, I could, I could seriously just carry on doing this all night. Even though I already wrote all of this, I could happily just write all the code again. <laughs> I, I get such a kick out of these, um, this very low level interactivity. It's not as if I've got forms and sliders and stuff here. Um, HTML5 includes most of those components. I've put some examples in the repo. Um, you can dig through and, and uncomment them and check them out. Like you can put checkboxes in to say, um, I don't know, give me your best prediction or give me your top two predictions. Like, you know, we don't have to pass this probability back here. We can make all sorts of decisions about what information. 
let the user decide what information they get back. Yeah. Um, now. Yeah, that's pretty neat, Matt. I mean, this could be a you know, a tab of another app, right? That you know you started um, because this is a Flask app. I think you can multi-tab these things and have something like the unsupervised exploration kind of at the front end. And yeah, you can do. I mean, you can just put a workflow. Every endpoint is different. I mean, you can put whatever yeah. ever Python code you want in each endpoint. It could go off, and you could have an endpoint that does something totally random, um, nothing to do with the rest of your app. If you were, you know, um, so inclined. I mean, it's it really is like each one is a little container, which is why when you look at the master app, you'll see that I've built it so that you wouldn't build an app like this. Like I've preserved almost like fossils every step as a different endpoint. Um, you know, right. normally you would be just building out one increasingly sophisticated um, tool. Yeah. Now, I sort of want to show you the code at least for what, um, because we get, we get, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up. Like, I don't want to uh, belabor this. Maybe I'll just go and record a part two tomorrow or something, because, uh, <laughs> like I say, I just get a kick out of this uh, technology. But um, let's go and have a look at... Oh no, this is that's the one I'm in. Um, I'll open App Master and let's have a look at this app and we can just talk about what next. Um, well, what next is the upload? Because for the upload, we're not sending a URL back anymore. It's not a piece of text. I can't just put it in a GET request, right? I've actually got to send a body of data which can be arbitrarily large and it will be encrypted, um, but I'm gonna need to handle a different kind of request because the form's gonna send back data now. So um, on the back end, what that means is I've gotta um, tell Flask that I'm going to accept get and post requests. I'm, you don't have to handle a get request on this endpoint, but you know I'm gonna serve a form here, so I need the browser to respond, so I have to handle a get request here. But if this was an API only, there's no reason why you can't have a post only endpoint. Um, so we say, okay, if I got a post, then I've got data. That's my assumption. And uh, here's how I go and grab the data. It's a bunch of bytes. So I can open it in the same way. I can make an image in exactly the same way as we did before in the utils. And uh, now I've got a pill image. So now I can send that to my predict from image function exactly like before classifier, pill image, um, and then I get back a dictionary, and then I'm just doing exactly what I just did just now, except I don't have a URL to add to the dictionary anymore, right? So if I want the image to show up on the front end again, I'm gonna have to send those bytes back that I got, um, because I can't just send back the pill image, it's not gonna, the front end doesn't know what to do with that. So um, the typical way to send stuff around on the internet, images around, is with these byte, uh, sorry, base64 encoded data. Uh, what's base64? Well, it's just like hex or octal or binary. It's just that instead of base16 or base8 or base2, it's base64. So um, you have 64 characters to encode with. So like all of the alphabet plus all of the uppercase alphabet plus all of the numbers and a couple of punctuation marks. Um, so it's just a string, right? So we can pass strings around. Uh, they don't get um, you know, molested by the intervening internet machinery. So, or pipes, whatever they are. Um, and then I'm gonna send that dictionary back. So really, it's nothing has changed. Like it's just a little bit different because of the fact that we're handling a post. Well, okay, what does the front end look like for this post request? Well, let's go open. Um, I've got a form called uh, where I was going with it before <laughs> and just about saved myself. Um, upload. I'm in the wrong app. Why can't I remember that? Uh, templates. Upload.html. Um, so here's the form. It looks so similar to the get form. It's just that now it's a post method and I've got this like uh, encoding type multi-part form data extra kind of keyword in the uh, form. Um, obviously going to a different endpoint and it's not accepting a URL, any, URL anymore so it's type as file um, and if that's it. I mean that's the only difference. It's really almost the same and that's the thing that renders um, when you look at this app on your phone um, that's you know this 
uh, little form here. Um, sorry, that's not really in focus, is it? Uh, but you get the idea that it looks just like the other form I made. So there's no reason why you couldn't put both forms on one page and say, got a URL, give me it here. Got an image to upload, give me it here. What's really cool is because it says um, type equals file, accept equals image, when you go on your phone and you hit, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to hit upload. When you go choose file, um, you, you get, it knows it's expecting images. So it opens like the camera, sorry, the whatever. In my case, the Google Images uh, app and it has the camera option is right there. So you don't have to do anything else other than say in this form that you're accepting an image and the intent shows up differently on, in this case, the mobile device or the computer desktop. Um, like if I go open this uh, form, well, I'm not running it in this app, but um, if you opened it on your computer, it would only show you image files. So it's a super, like HTML is just this fantastic environment where a lot of things are like just taken care of for you. Um, now, like I say, I don't have that endpoint to show you on here, but you can see it on the live app at, uh, what was it, mattexample.pythonanywhere.com uh, slash upload. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. There's, I've got a couple more things to say. Sorry, I think I've got three more things to say. Um, one of them is... What about when you want to send back a matplotlib plot? Because that's often what I want to do. Because like I told you before, I'm kind of a low-level person and I don't use stuff like Plotly because uh, I'm a bit slow. Uh, and I, I, I use matplotlib and then I'm like, well, I want to send a matplotlib plot back, but I don't want to write a file, right? And I don't know, all, all I can do here is send back a bunch of bytes. Well, in the utils, um, I've shown you how you can make a matplotlib plot, and then just at the end, you can make a bytes IO, and then save file, uh, or save fig rather, into the bytes IO. Like I told you, like the bytes IO is like a file handle, so you can write to it. And that's basically writing the, you're getting matplotlib to put its plot into memory. And now I can base64 encode that, and send it back, and I already know what to do with those, I can render those. So that's how I can send back a matplotlib plot, and if you go to, I think, um, the plot endpoint um, or path on that app, so matexample.pythonanywhere.com slash plot, um, you can give it a URL. Oh no, it's a file. Um, so why don't I take a picture of my famous? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you got to see my because I, I was being such an idiot with uh, with Zoom and everything. There's my fossil. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a picture of that and um, with my hand in it and upload it. And it's a hot dog. No, it's a dinosaur. <laughs> so so anyway. It's brilliant. The fish is actually a dinosaur. The fish is a dinosaur, uh, which you know. The whole is an understandable. Time. It's an understandable mistake. It's the sort of mistake a, a three-year-old might make. It's a fossil. The whole um, time we thought it was about the fishes. It was really dinosaurs pulling the strings. I'm super upset because I don't know anyone who um, knows me well knows that I don't like dark mode. I don't know why my app is in dark mode on my phone. Like, why is it doing that? But anyway, um, there I've got a little plot of the probabilities of the f different classes. And that's coming from matplotlib, plotted into memory and then sent to the front end as a base64. Um, so I put that in just in case you want to, you've got stuff that you're generating on the back end that you need to pass to the front end images. Uh, and you're not sure how to do that. Um, okay, that was one thing. Next thing is I just wanted to mention uh, what about um, what about like an API? Like, how would you do that from a um, uh, from like a notebook? How would you send an image from a Jupyter notebook when you don't have a URL for the image? Um, so I've got an example in the hitting our own API. Um, uh, that's a post with the URL. So here we are, post with a base64 encoded image. And um, I can't use my local host, but I can use the map example Python anywhere, I think, um, dot com. 
and we can base64 encode one of the URLs that I showed you earlier, right? I took out some at the top of my page here. Um, so now I've got a string. We can look at that, like image b64. It's gross, obviously. Um, you can't do anything with that. Uh, but we can send it to our server. So all I have to do is set up some headers. We haven't made a post request yet with JSON, with um, requests, so we get to do that. So um, here we are. Here's the header. I just have to say um, I accept uh, JSON. Here is my here is the JSON I'm going to pass to the server. Um, it's just a dictionary, Python dictionary. So it's not really JSON. It's Strictly speaking, JSON, I guess, is a string, but this is a Python dict. And now I do request.post this time to the um, endpoint that I already defined with that JSON and those headers. And um, I got a 200, which is nice. And I guess I can look at the JSON because that's what it sends back. And uh, it got fish. And I think URL2, no, well, I don't, well, I can just paste it, a copy it, I guess. It's probably a 4AM. No, it's a fish. I can't resist proving it. There it is. Okay, so um, so that's in the hitting our our web API um, notebook. What if you if you run App Master, then the code in there will work on your machine. Like it will just you know hit your own uh, endpoint. Um, so here I've got a disk image. You know, same thing. Base64 encode it, pass it to my app, get back the result. It, it works in exactly the same way. So how I keep mentioning Python anywhere. Um, like it's well, I just I can't see Slack. All I can see is Brendan's face. Um, <laughs> uh, all, you enjoy it. All you're gonna do is make a. Uh, Make an app for yourself. I forgot to. I guess because I kept showing it to you, I didn't. I can delete that app that I've is currently serving. Uh, so when you log into Python Anywhere for the first time, this is what you'll see. And all you're going to do is go add new web app. Next, Flask. So click on Flask in the middle there, and then go for Python. I'm. I think it'll work on 3.8. I'm going to hedge my bets and put 3.7. Um, accept the defaults. Oh, actually, it's called Flask App. Sorry, I guess maybe change that to app.py because that's what ours is called. Um, but here we are; it's done it, and or it's created the, like this empty app. But I can go to directory now, and now I've got. Well, I guess it's all here because I didn't delete my files. Um, but now all you have to do is go upload a file, upload utils, upload the rf.gzip, upload your templates in a separate folder. Um, and put, I guess, because I forgot to change the name of the app, you can't just upload app.py. You're going to have to like open that one. This is a full editor, so you can edit everything um, and just replace it with your stuff. And then when you're done, you're going to save. It's not quite as elegant as the dev server here for Flask on your local, um, but you can save your files and then hit this round button here. Reload the app. Don't hit this. I'm not even sure what this run button does, so just leave that one alone. It's really confusing. Um, but you just want the green one and the circle you arrow. That's it. Okay. I'm so sorry, Brendan. I'm, I'm such a bad time uh, planner, as you and Victoria no, no, this is both, great. both know. Um, I guess all I, all I really wanted to say to people at the end was, like, um, the, the key things in this, all of it, showing stuff to people mainly is um, letting go of any feeling of completeness or perfection. <laughs> like mm -hmm. if, if you're Rowan Cockett, then yeah, you can build a, an amazing uh, MVP for Ioxa in a month. Um, but you know, f like I, I certainly couldn't and, um, but I might be able to do something interesting in a week. And the, the thing to do is to then Go show it to people and get them using it because no MVP, no idea survives first contact with the user. So, um, you know, that's, well, Matt, that's my I, message. So from monitoring, the Slack, from monitoring the Slack channel, you have got this into the hands of users. It has been actively used and, you know, it's it's working to a certain degree. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore because I just uh, deleted the entire app. Yeah, but... someone pointed out that. 
that it might have been zapped. But um, it'll be back. Yeah, you know, they've been. I think you've. I think you've captured some imagination. So. Okay. Um, um, anyway, yeah, this has been good. I just. I just. I wish I was better at, at, at planning stuff out because. Um, anyway, it would be fun to do this. To do this sort of live as in a classroom type setting, you know. Um, yeah. So maybe what we'll do is we'll put together a class like that, um, you know, like a, a, a day or something and try and do that over the summer sometime so that anyone who wants to dig in and this wasn't quite enough, we'll, we'll get there, we'll do it. Yeah, indeed. And great for a hackathon you know, as an approach as well, right? You can see how someone could be focused on building the application while someone's working on the machine learning model and someone's working on the data set perhaps, and, and someone might be working on the UI. You know, you can separate concerns that way and have the team members all doing something. And the UI is a great way for somebody who's not a programmer to start getting involved with right. design and stuff like that, you know, or to maybe get into a little bit of CSS and HTML, which is sort of a nice entry level coding skill um yeah oh man i feel i'm so stoked I, I just want to carry on but we're gonna we're gonna call it we're gonna call it a day i call it a night some of you in europe if you're in europe you must be up quite late um thanks so much for for listening it's been a, it's been a blast we'll pick it up again soon anything you want to say thanks, brendan everyone. before i no thanks everyone it's been uh, it's been a great week and uh you know please reach out if you guys want to talk about this more and keep this discussion going. Um, yep. Yeah, keep on fishing. <laughs>